Order. The regular meeting of the Tiverton Town Council, Monday, June 9th, 2014. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk. Present. 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 Yes, ma'am. The consent agenda. No minutes available. Receipt of minutes from the following boards and commissions. Art Council, Library Services, Wastewater Management Commission, Correspondence Received and Filed, Tiverton Prevention Coalition Newsletter, Rescheduling of the public hearing to July 14th to establish ordinance to reorganize planning department pursuant to Charter Section 407, 1 and 6. Kate Michaud, Administrative Officer, Distribution of May Activities Report. Town Administrator, Distribution of Department Monthly Reports for May. Council, anything to be removed? Okay, seeing none, I will entertain a motion. So moved. Second. We have motion and second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, Mr. President, I move that we move item C1 on the agenda to uh, following item 4. Uh, what we have now is A7. It's my understanding we do not have an A7, an open public forum. Right. Mm -hmm. So I move that uh, C1 be moved to that uh, spot. Second. We have a motion to second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, we'll now go on with the non-advertised licenses. Manuel J. and Deborah Linares doing business as J. and D. Hot Dogs, 1540 Bogomash Road. Request approval of victuing license subject to meeting all legal requirements. Uh, Linares here. Okay. Uh, then I will entertain a motion. I move that we uh, approve the licensing request for the Victula license for Manuel J. and Deborah LaHares, DBA, J. and D. Hot Dogs, 1540 Boogamash Road. Second. Subject, subject to meeting all subject legal, to meeting all all legal, legal requirements. requirements. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay, we will begin with the public hearing and public presentations. First, a presentation from the Historical Cemetery Commission's annual report. Good evening. Can Good you evening. hear me? Okay. I'm just going to give a little short presentation of the uh, Historical <coughs> Cemeteries Commission. Yeah, my name is Robert Martin. And with me tonight is uh, Jim Spears. We're both uh, co-chairs on the commission. Uh, I don't know if you've received this, but uh, we did submit uh, back in March the paperwork. Uh, just to give you an idea of our mission, it is to supervise the many uh, small uh, cemeteries, the family cemeteries located in the town of Tiverton. Uh, in accordance with the Charter. Uh, as a reminder, the historic cemeteries, uh, normally some of them have veterans in them, and we try to maintain that uh, flags are placed on those cemeteries as required. There are more than 80 cemeteries in town, and they are here, there, and everywhere, as you've seen them as you pass by. Uh, there are several cemeteries that do not fall under our purview, and I'll just list them here. They being Pocasset, the Hillside Cemetery, the Lake Road Cemetery, and the Pleasant View Cemetery. Those cemeteries, uh, the Pocasset is m maintained by the Cemetery Commission in town. The other ones are normally under uh, separate management, uh, and they're normally private cemeteries. I'm going to list some of the activities that we accomplished.
accomplished in 2013. Uh, we've had two new people on our uh, group, uh, David Bell and Carrie Bailey, and we are now up to five members. Uh, that's the requirement for the minimum by charter. And one of our members uh, was interested in getting on the Rhode Island Advisory uh, Committee for Historical Cemeteries, and that's been a nice assist because then we're filled in on a lot of the information that comes forward out of the state. The... Uh, as far as the maintenance, what we try to do with our budget is maintain four uh, cemeteries in town. T two of them are on Main Road, one is, uh, and two of them are on Crandall. At one time, we were maintaining cemeteries on uh, Stafford Road, but because of our budget uh, cut back a few years back, that's no longer possible. Uh, one of the big things we did last year was we had a uh, request from National Grid that came through Town Hall to uh, monitor the operations in some of the cemeteries that they were doing to remove trees because of storm problems that they had had in the past. And uh, I believe there were either three or four cemeteries involved, but one of them was really bad. There were two huge maples taken down and, and we were there to protect the stones and to ensure that the stone walls were not damaged. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, Jim will take over here on the public outreach and give you an idea of uh, where we're headed here. And if you have questions, I'm sure we can answer them at the end. Good evening, I'm Jim Spears. And as Bob indicated, I'm one of the two co-chair. We have a fairly active public outreach uh, program. One of the things that we do, and Isabel Hart is the um, primary person of that, and that's assisting members of the public with genealogical research. Um, at random intervals, we get requests from people who, who are chasing down um, you know, ancestors and Isabel is probably the, our local expert at you know, who's buried where for this sort of research. Um, we've, we also have a program that Isabel is working on and that's uh, researching all of the 80 odd cemeteries to the best of our ability in terms of ownership, who's buried in them, documenting the stones as they exist today. She's quite an artist, we have many uh, beautiful headstones in our cemeteries dating back to the early 1800s and late 1700s and she's uh, trying to document those so that we'll have a record, a permanent record because all of these stones in time will uh, fade and, and disappear. We have a cemetery, um, called, um, the Hamley Family Cemetery, number 41. That's above the intersection of Sousa Road and Main Road. And the Hambly family has contributed some amount of money to help us maintain the cemetery. It's one of these, um, a cemetery in, in Tiverton will deteriorate rapidly. Stuff will grow in a hurry, and if you don't keep after them, they will uh, effectively disappear. And as Bob indicated, for Memorial Day, we do plant um, flags on veterans' graves. We're not the only entity in town that's doing that. There are, there are several other organizations that are also um, doing flags for veterans. In our pending actions, one of the more interesting cemeteries that we have is in the Heritage um, Park mobile home community. And if you look at it now, it's basically a mound that's about, oh, the size of a, a van, an uh, average uh, van, and there are the remains, it is the remains of a colonial cemetery, as near as we can tell. And we've had the state <coughs> archaeologist looking at it, and there's no record whatsoever of the cemetery. The land in which it stands has been tremendously modified, and we're <coughs> working with the people who live there to um, keep the cemetery from fading away. We also have a goal of 
having an adopt a cemetery. Many of these cemeteries are in the middle of somebody's yard because in the old days, in the 1800s, the cemetery was in the middle of a farm. Over years, the uh, farm was broken up and today in 2014, uh, there are cemeteries that sit in somebody's front yard. The cemetery may physically not belong to the landowner and it may belong to the descendants of the family that the cemetery uh, holds. So we're, what we're interested in doing is establishing this um, adopt a cemetery where we would hope that people who own land on which a cemetery is present would take it upon themselves to mow the grass, cut back the weeds, and we would help them as, to the extent possible. Uh, there's always questions of you know, who would be reliable in case someone were to be hurt in one of these, and we're working on researching uh, that kind of question. And with that, if there are questions, I'll be hap we'll be happy to uh, try to answer. Okay. Any questions from the council? <clears throat> I just have a really quick question. So yes. Thank you to the both of you for preparing this. Uh, aside from the adopt a cemetery program that kind of you outline here, I mean, are there other ways for folks in town to get involved to help maintain this important piece of our past? Certainly, anyone who is interested in um, wielding a weed whacker, a pair of clippers, <laughs> pair of loppers, um, if they contact any of us. Uh, we, we have, as Bob indicated, we have two local landscapers that we keep four cemeteries well maintained. There are a bunch of other cemeteries that, depending on the, our t own personal time and energy, you know, we work on. Uh, these are mostly ones that are along the, the uh, traveled roads. The ones that are back in the woods, are, they, they tend to get ignored. But that said, if someone is interested in helping, uh, we are out working on cemeteries often enough that we would be more than happy to put people to work. And if someone wants to work on their own time, we can give them guidelines as to you know, what you can do, what you can't do, what the best way to uh, work around a uh, 19th century or an 18th century headstone would be. Sure. And if folks were interested, they could probably get in touch with you via the clerk's office or town hall mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And, and just one, one comment. Uh, please extend our congratulations to David Bell for his appointment to the <coughs> Rhode Island Advisory Commission on Historical Cemeteries. Great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we will now begin the public hearing. A public hearing on zoning map amendment and zoning ordinance text amendments to implement form base code zoning Bliss Corners and North Main Road and general changes to the use table for commercial uses. Uh, Kate Michaud and uh, Ken Buckland. Good evening. My name is Ken Buckland. I'm a principal with the Cecil Group, a uh, planning and design firm that's done the, uh, the major part of the work on the form-based code for the town. Um, our team includes the, um, the firm of Union Studios Architects, and a, uh, Fitz, out of Providence, and Fitzgerald and Halliday, uh, incorporated also out of Rhode Island. The project was funded by by federal funds and uh, through the, the distribution from statewide planning. Zoning can be a, a problem if you, if, to try to understand. And uh, typically what happens is the, the, the zoning code can be uh, uh, almost like a foreign language to a lot of people. And, and one of the things that we try to do with form-based codes is to get them to uh, 
to an understanding for people to know what kind of development is going to occur with the, with the zoning and so that not only the, the owner of the land but also the neighbors can also understand what kind of development can take place. Our particular uh, intent for this particular project was to try to, in, to create attractive commercial districts without being onerous with regulations because too often form-based codes can be uh, too restrictive and, and, and too much process within the, the regulations so it's too difficult to get through the, the, uh, the process uh, to get your entitlements. And so what we're trying to do is create something that, that also is, has a clear set of standards and is a manageable permitting process so that the, the, uh, the projects can proceed, as, can proceed appropriately. And with that, the idea that you create by investment, creating a more attractive location, you're encouraging customers, you're encouraging tourists to come to the uh, locations uh, in the commercial centers because what we're talking about is commercial areas. Now, this isn't exactly a, a true form-based code as, as in uh, the, uh, the classic style of, of, of the zoning concept. This is what's called a hybrid code because what we had to do was figure out what worked within the zoning regulations and what needed to be changed. And so it's a combination of, of amendments that are being proposed within this. The, the process included an online survey, several public workshops, and uh, a number of drafts and revisions to the, to the regulations. The, the amendments are uh, centered on uh, Article 4, Section 19, uh, changes to the official zoning map and in the description uh, I, I, it, in terms of, of reading the official announcement of it this is just a description of the of the elements uh, there are also uh, within this uh, recommendations for amendments or update in the comprehensive community plan to include the infrastructure pieces in, in the uh, in this in this concept uh, the reason being that the, the roads that we're talking about that within the zoning districts are state-owned state roads. And so the, the town has more limited capability of affecting change within those, those roads. But if you put the, this information into the comp plan, into your comprehensive community plan, then that information can be used to uh, encourage the investment by, by state infrastructure uh, funds for the improvements of the, of the roads. The areas we were talking about are the, uh, we're looking at, were the general commercial districts on Main Road and on Stafford Road in Bliss Four Corners. This particular graphic shows uh, the colors indicate the different types of land uses uh, on within the district. That red line that extends down along Main Road is what the existing general commercial district is. And if you notice, you can see, it's, it's pretty much parallels the right-of-way. So what it means is it cuts through properties, it cuts through lots, so that a lot of lots have, have both uh, residential zoning or, or some other zoning and the general commercial zoning district. So part of this was the idea of thinking about how do we make it easier to understand zoning not only for the property owners but the neighbors. And so we, th we proposed in this, in this change in the zoning map to uh, line up with the, with the lot lines and you'll see that. The next slide shows the Bliss Four Corners existing general commercial district. The, the, uh, uh, the blue area on the lower left is the library which is under, under construction at this time. Uh, the, the blue area in the upper left uh, on, the, uh, on the pond is the former school that has been sold to uh, private, uh, for private development. In, an, in the next slide, we show what the existing uh, general commercial district uh, encourages by the dimensional standards in the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the regulations. And it, it requires a, a, a minimum setback, so it encourages the, the buildings to be set back and, and parking to be put in front, which isn't bad in terms of uh, business to be attra attracting customers to know that there, there's parking, but aren't necessarily the most attractive types of, of development in all cases. 
in all locations along Main Road and, and along Stafford and, and Bliss Four Corners. So in looking at the zoning, we, we decided that there were three sub-areas, uh, three different, distinctly different areas uh, that could be zoned in, in more appropriately to fit with the kind of development that's there, plus what we want to encourage as, as development in the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the future. And those three districts that were proposed were the traditional Main Street, which is what you might think of as that typical New England kind of configuration where the, the, the buildings are up behind the, the sidewalk, the, the, uh, 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 the buildings abut each other in, in many cases, in most cases, and uh, there is a, uh, uh, a scale that, that, that you might think of in, in uh, terms of uh, typical New England. The second district was a neighborhood business, and this was a lower density transitional area. The idea that there is, there, we want to create a character that's a little bit more residential in nature, that fits with the, the neighborhood surrounding the, the commercial district, and would, it would, uh, would it still allow for commercial development, but would, be ha would have a more residential character. And the third was a pedestrian friendly district. We, we know what our commercial strip malls look like. What we want is something that's a little bit more friendly for the pedestrian and the bicyclist. We don't necessarily want to change, radically change the, the, the commercial district development, but have something that encourages development that, that makes the pedestrian feel more comfortable, that makes the bicyclist feel more comfortable. So you can get a, a whole, a whole, whole uh, different kind of, of, of movement through the area. And that's one of the things we found is that there are a lot of people walking in, in these districts. A lot of people walking on Main Road, on the new sidewalks that were put in uh, f just a few years back by the state. And a lot of people walking between businesses in some of these districts. And so what we wanted to do is, is within the regulations, encourage that clustering of, of uh, commercial development that supports the walking and biking. So in the next slide, we'll look at, at we'll start to walk through our, wh where we put these sub-districts. And for the traditional Main Street uh, district, the, uh, the location was uh, that northern end of, of, of Main Road from Canonicus up to the state line. And the, the orange area in that district shows what we talk about as, as a traditional Main Street sub-district. The uh, image that's shown here gives you the idea, I think you're probably very familiar with it, but the buildings being, being very close together are touching. A lot of cases parking behind the buildings already, uh, some parking on the, on the street as part of that, of, that, uh, of, of that development. And that's where that area looks, looks to be most appropriate for this traditional Main Street district. Our, our, our lot diagram is, is one where the, instead of a minimum setback of, of, uh, on, the, on the street, there uh, right away. There's a, there's a maximum setback so that it pushes the building up, encourages the parking behind, encourages the, the linking of parking behind the buildings that, that uh, get, so there's more efficient parking and provides the, the uh, but um, uh, provides that space in, in, the, uh, in the rear of the property for buffer and connection to, uh, to uh, other uh, uh, right of ways. The, uh, the idea of, of not necessarily requiring that the, the building be, be at a zero setback line, but there could be some variation. There could be a little bit of a setback, 10 feet, to allow some activity outside within the, the front of the building as part of that, of that uh, district. For the infrastructure piece of this, uh, we uh, looked at the uh, idea of, of put, putting uh, the, the parking uh, on Main Road, however, the, the uh, Fitzgerald and Halliday, our engineer, had found that there was a limitation on the width of the right-of-way. So our, our concept is to have two travel lanes and one parking lane that would, that would vary from one side of the, of the street to the other within this, this district. This would be uh, uh, the element that's uh, improved by the state or with the state's approval for for uh, the use of funds uh, on the road, on Main Road. Our next district is the neighborhood business district, which is actually in two areas on, on uh, Main Road. And our first area, uh, 
goes from Canonicus down to Russell Drive as a, as a location. Uh, now, within this district, as you see, the lines, ag again, follow the, the uh, rear of the property boundaries uh, to, uh, to be consistent with, with what uh, the properties are, that are there. Uh, with the exception of those uh, properties that are larger than, than 10 acres in size are already committed to some institutional use or th the cemetery being one of the option, one of the uses on the on main road that would be uh, that would not have the line uh, extended beyond. Uh, I wanted to point out as well that in that area in the middle of this section the the line follows main road directly and uh, does, and is taken away from the the properties to the the eastern side, and this is an area of, of cypress, uh, uh, spruce, the, uh, the, the, um, the area where the, the road is much further below the, the residential development. So there's a significant grade change coming down to the road. There is no um, connection between the, uh, no uh, physical connection between the properties and, and, main, and main road. And so the, the, uh, there's no particular reason to have the the commercial development uh, connected uh, in, in that in that uh, area because there is no commercial development. Our the the, uh, the, the look of the area is more uh, separated uh, buildings, uh, 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 maybe uh, multi-story, but but with uh, spaces available around around those um, uh, those buildings for the purpose of, of uh, parking and activities. So that the idea that there could be conversions of buildings to commercial, residential buildings to commercial, or new construction, and new construction, we'd want to make it look like similar to the character of the development that, that is already there. Our next neighborhood business uh, district area is further down between Grandview Avenue and, and, and Rocky Avenue. And again, the same, the same uh, criteria apply where the, the, the uh, Zoning boundary line is, is moved to the rear of the of the of the of the uh, of the lots that are fronting on on Main Road. Our um, uh, illustration here again shows that the uh, although there are commercial properties, that the um, uh, the separation of buildings and the uh, uh, the landscaping it creates uh, something that looks a little bit different as as a uh, as a as a plan uh, of development very different from that traditional main street uh, kind of concept and our our diagram tries uh, and this is this is the uh, it shows the setbacks the uh, location of parking the location of driveways that are would be uh, permitted under the dimensional standards of the of the uh, of the regulation if it is to be adopted this would be consistent with a uh, neighbor, residential neighborhood where we want the parking to be on, on each lot. Uh, the infrastructure piece in north uh, on, on Main Road in, this, in these sections would be uh, one with a, a median, uh, so it restricts movement in the left turns except uh, in, in those locations where the, uh, 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 the, me the median is broken open and, and, and that would allow for for a safer uh, crossing of, of pedestrians through that, that area. Our third district is our pedestrian friendly destination. And we called it pedestrian friendly destination for two reasons. One, we want it to be significant enough as a commercial district to attract people to the location. And secondly, we wanted it to be uh, designed so that it would be uh, uh, encouraged walking between the businesses and between properties and along, along uh, north uh, along along Main Road to make it more comfortable, and our and our areas for for the pedestrian uh, friendly destination district uh, extend from the area you may be familiar with Tom's Market down to the to the Rite Aid, and from uh, from uh, Old Main uh, down to uh, the southern extent of Sousa Road, which is where the existing general commercial district uh, is located. Uh, in, in terms of uh, development, there is already significant and recent development. We don't necessarily see uh, significant change, but there will be some change of Rite Aid being one of the options that, that could be a, 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 a near-term redevelopment project. And so what we've, we've encouraged with the, uh, 
with the design of the, stand, the uh, design standards is one where the, the landscaping and, and, the, and the setbacks along the street you know, encourage and make it comfortable to walk in front of these commercial areas and also lead you in and allow the connections through the, the parking areas and driveway areas into, into the, uh, the property. Uh, the idea was to, uh, uh, in terms of infrastructure, uh, and again, this is the uh, state, uh, state road, was to uh, make it uh, uh, allow for turning movements, but to keep the traffic slow enough so, so pedestrians would feel comfortable and safe in, uh, in the uh, area within this uh, commercial area. So that we have a, a center uh, turn lane um, that would be, that be, that would be uh, um, split in, uh, in some areas to allow the, the pedestrian, pedestrian crossings. Our, our last general commercial district, as pointed out, was the, was the Bliss Four Corners. And there are two different uh, types of uh, development areas here. There are the, the residential, residents, the, uh, the church, institutional uses, as they're called, and the commercial corner at, at Stafford and uh, Bulgarmarsh, uh, at Bulgarmarsh intersection. And again, just to remind you, uh, that, that kind of development is encouraged by the general commercial uh, zoning district. And what we've proposed for Bliss Four Corners is a pedestrian-friendly district, again, if, uh, as, a, as a single district, extending to the, to the uh, property lines, uh, not including the, the library, in this case, uh, as, a, uh, as a district uh, that would um, uh, be for commercial purposes, for the most part, and uh, um, would be, uh, uh, allow those, those lots to be uh, fully developed in, in the way that the uh, pedestrian-friendly district uh, encourages, allows for for uh, a parking in front, but also encourages the buildings to be moved up and, and as in the design standards, uh, requires the pedestrian links and, and the connections. One of the pieces that, um, uh, that had come out at the time that, that we were working on this last year was a roundabout by the, by the state. And in the, um, uh, in looking at that, Fitzgerald and Halliday, the engineers, had spent some time thinking about how you actually make a, a roundabout pedestrian friendly. And so if there are roundabouts here, if there's a roundabout here, or in any other location within Tiverton, what they've done is they've come up with the design standards, the design criteria that should apply to make it comfortable for, for pedestrians to walk around roundabouts. Because typically what happens is people don't stop, and so there, it makes it a little bit more dangerous so for, for that, that conflict between cars and, and pedestrians. So that was the purpose for, for, for doing that. One of the other elements that uh, was recommended was the, uh, in, the, in, the, in this, um, in this uh, document was the idea of creating gateways so that there's an identity that's uh, defined at the intersection uh, as, uh, with the idea of, of signage or, or um, some variation in the in the streetscape to uh, make it clear that you're at the uh, the center of, of Bliss Four Corners. So that's the zone. Those are the zoning map amendments that, that are being proposed. Uh, there is also changes being suggested in the district use table. Uh, the what we found is that we wouldn't ne necessarily uh, look at the use table in a form-based code because you're looking at the character of development and you're going with what's, what's available. However, we found there were so many problems in the, in the uh, use district table that it made it confusing as to what was allowed as a use within there. And that just makes it more difficult to go through the permitting process. So uh, within the use table, there are a number of, of, of changes being made. Uh, many of these are to conform with state law. Uh, and to, uh, uh, and in one, in the, the case of retail, to be a little bit more specific about what are the different types of retail. Because in the use table, what had been done is that they tried to list out all the uses that sort of fit different categories and try to make determinations as to what was the most appropriate for, for a special permit or an asset right development. And so what we've done is say, take away that and just put it in by size, uh, 15,000, um, uh, square foot building 
and a 40,000 square foot building uh, or anything over are, are, the, are the kind of the, the character of development that you're looking at, not necessarily the use itself that comes along with, it, with, the, uh, with the, uh, the, the district table. So that, those are the, some of the changes that are made into the district use table. Uh, there is also a piece on the um, accessory uses. And what we found was that the building uh, commissioner was having trouble trying to get uh, interpretations of what was detrimental, uh, of determination of detrimentality or impairment. And so what we've done is added a definition so that it's easier to, to handle some of those, those decisions in terms of the process to, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the district, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the uses that are defined within the uh, regulations. In addition to the, the use table is our design guidelines. And these are the uh, categories that the design guidelines are, are, are put into in the, uh, uh, in the regulations, uh, proposed amendments. The, the illustrations that, w that are used uh, are photographic and um, drawings to uh, describe the character. Uh, there's information on key points as to uh, the idea is it provides information as to how you would go about creating the kind of character that we're talking about to make it more user friendly as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, uh, a tool for, for uh, uh, getting better quality uh, development. Uh, there is also some specific uh, uh, design uh, uh, sections that talk about things like parking and uh, building location and the relationship uh, between, between those. Uh, this is a, uh, a summary of what the, uh, the, the amendments are. Uh, as as the, uh, the document itself is available to the uh, to the community and has been and available for that that purpose, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, the, the uh, planning board and and Kate, the administrator, for their help during this process of and for all you who came to the workshops and participated with the online survey as part of that process. So thank you very much. This concludes my uh, my introduction. Uh, Ken, before you leave. Some issues have uh, been brought up, and I just want to know if you would address uh, some of them. Sure. Uh, the uh, letter we received from uh, Pauline and John Neary are uh, regarding um, the zoning map amendment changes to move neighborhood districts up to the property lines in some areas. Correct, and I am familiar with that. Um, in this particular case, it's it's a an in, it's the idea that what we've done is is taken those split lots with the zoning district and put the lots on, put the uh, lot lines consistent and, con and concurrent with the, the zoning district boundary. Um, and they would like to have that line remain where it is so there's a little bit more of a, of a buffer to, the, to their, um, uh, their, their properties. However, under Article 3, Section 4 of the, of the zoning ordinance, the building commissioner is allowed to modify the district boundary by 50 feet uh, so that there, this hard and fast line is not hard and fast within a subdivided, a, a split lot. If it's on the property uh, boundary, it will always be on the property boundary. One way or another, they'll know which, wh what can be developed. But in fact, um, they could see that, that uh, commercial development even with that lot line splitting it, the, uh, the, the uh, property line that, where it is. So. Um, Maybe not, maybe not uh, helpful to uh, what they want to accomplish, but uh, uh, it, it's probably more consistent with an idea that you have, you know, what you're going to get if it's if it, the uh, the zoning line is at the, uh, uh, the concurrent with the lot line. And, um, also, a question was raised uh, regarding, I guess, historic use of a property, um, where property has been general uh, commercial say for almost forever and under the new zoning some of that may change how would that affect you know businesses and properties as, as a pre-existing use it, it doesn't change uh, what what it will the only th the only time that this applies is when the develop a development occurs that there's somebody comes in to ask for a change of use or change of development and in that case the, these regulations would apply 
uh, essentially what happens under the under the uh, zoning regulations in, in the state of Rhode Island is if you have if you have a, some existing use you're you're protected uh, under um, as a continuation of that use uh, for as long as, as it's um, not abandoned. Okay. Okay. Uh, this being a public hearing, uh, we will now hear from the public. Please uh, state your name and your address. My name is Joseph R. Souza, 49 Hancock Street. Uh, I have to admit, I, I haven't read through everything, but uh, I went to the public hearings and heard a couple of the presentations. Uh, starting off with the design, the design standards, as it uh, plays into uh, the type of buildings <coughs> that uh, they're looking to have built. Now, it, it, it says to discourage flat roofs, single story. That was on page 27, it's just briefly. Uh, the majority of development that comes into town builds that type of a building, and there's a reason they do that, so that they can put the mechanical, the compressors and the different things up on the roof, enable them to in incorporate, in, uh, encase them with some sort of a wall so that the neighbors behind don't hear them. Uh, that's pretty standard in design for uh, buildings now. You can, you can put a roof above, you know, it's just sort of a, but you still have a flat roof below. Then they put sort of a facade above, but it, you're talking about putting developers into a lot of money when they're just trying to open up a, a small store. So, you know, to tell somebody for another Napa, for instance, has a standard building. It's a metal building. It's a standard blue. They got their lettering and things like that. Napa could never come to town and build a building and open up a parts store in the north end of town because one, the corporate wouldn't build a building in a town that doesn't fit there. 7-Elevens like that too, they have their standard building. And I mean, they'll, they'll work with the town, but to a certain point, it has to resemble the type of building that I'll see around the country. McDonald's the same way. You can see McDonald's five miles away. So, just on that. Uh, all right, uh, in the uh, code, when they're talking about the Main Street, Tivoli Main Street, and they're talking about buildings being right up, you know, the buildings right up on the roadway, well, Anybody who's been over in the north end during a snowstorm sees big trucks come down the road and the first thing they do is throw all the snow up against the building and cover the entire sidewalk. And as the snow continues, builds up, builds up, and the store owner's throwing it back in the street. And, the, and that's, that's kind of why architects and designers decided, you know, it's better to put the building back away. That way you can have a storage area across the front. That, it, you know, you have to think about, we're not in uh, North Carolina where, you know, Mayberry down there, these beautiful buildings, and it, we have to deal with conditions up here. So when you're talking about a store owner that's going to have to hire heavy equipment to remove snow, and I've done this in Newport down Lower Thing, we had to take the snow out, and it costs a stone, there's a lot of money. Fortunately, they do enough volume and sales down there to be able to afford the store owners, you know, get enough rent to pay for all this. We don't have that in the north end of town. We have small little consignment shops and stuff. How are they going to afford a $700 snow removal bill every time it snows? So we got to think about the stores and the people that are going to come to Tiverton. These designs are great, but telling these store owners, like I said, how they can build and what their building should look like and you know, what type of signage, we have to be a little more flexible in our code to attract business in town. I noticed that the signage, uh, the portion on the signage was looking a little better, it seems, you know, up in the, uh, those districts. Uh, all right, in the use chart, uh, you'll go through and you'll see each uh, district will have... Two more minutes, Mr. Susan. I'm just noticing the number of uh, not permitted and special use permits. It's like numerous special use permits, special use permit required for all these different businesses. Well, the last thing I just wanted to know is if uh, any research was done, and Ed, you had touched on this, every time we change the zoning, we create a pre-existing non-conforming use. So if we're telling these businesses that could, could have built a business, the type of business, then we change the zoning, 
and they're, they're, they're restricted to what, if, if somebody wants to, if they want to sell that property, we further restricted what can go on it. And it goes back to the use table where I was talking about all the non, uh, uh, non, non uh, things that you're not allowed to build in these districts. So I hope that this council will look very closely at what we're, uh, you know, restricting and what we're changing here. These people that own these properties have a right currently to put up this type of a building where it's an affordable block building with a flat roof and they put a nice front and they have parking in the front. This seems to take that right away from them. Uh, Randy LeBeau, 22 Last Street. Um, with these changes that's going to go on, a lot I recently purchased for an indoor, uh, indoor recreation. It changes from indoor recreation permitted to I need a special use permit. My project has already started. Um, am I going to be, if you guys decide to vote this thing in, am I going to be held to this, this new thing, or am I going to be held to what you guys already approved for me? Uh, we're going to listen to everything first and then figure out what, uh, what, what I'm sorry, uh, we're going to listen to everything first, Mr. LeBeau, uh, so we get the full hearing, then I'm sure Mr. Buckland uh, will address existing, pre-existing, uh, already started, that types of things, and then I'm sure Mr. Tights will weigh in on that also. But that, that didn't answer my question. I, I can't answer your question until I hear all, all the parts. Will I have an answer tonight on this question? Uh, I just if, if we decide tonight. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mr. President and Council Members. Uh, John Paglarini, 67 William Barton Drive. I am a land use attorney. I have a master's degree in community planning, and I demolished the Ranger School. My concern is the vision. I expressed several concerns at the charrette. Um, Councilman Lambert was in my group. We talked about several things. One of the questions I had was, Bliss Four Corners is not a vacant lot, and you want to make it a pedestrian-friendly environment. We have three-foot sidewalks with telephone poles and fire hydrants in the middle of them. My question at that time was, what was the investment the town is going to make in the sidewalks. How are we going to make this a pedestrian friendly? Is one property to build a five foot wide sidewalk as proposed here, or are we going to do it as a comprehensive sidewalk system, all the same material? We're going to have cobblestone bricks, asphalt, concrete. What, what's our vision of the Bliss Four Corners pedestrian area was my concern then, and I don't know that it's been addressed here. It is a pedestrian-friendly neighborhood that's proposed for the Bliss Four Corner area. I can legally put in gas stations, automotive repair shops, vehicle rental agencies, car washes, storage of boats and marine. I can put in open lot storage of mulch auto sales, truck sales, trailer sales, commercial off-street parking for school buses and vehicles. I don't understand how the use table conforms with the vision of being pedestrian friendly. There are going to be certain things that you're going to have to say no to. Do you want to have a pedestrian friendly area so you can walk to a car lot? Maybe they belong in the neighborhood business district, but they might not belong in there. You somehow, as a town council, need to incentivize people to sell their residential home or their building and have it demolished in order to conform with what is being proposed before you here. What incentive has the town proposed to make that happen? And it's a matter of economics. And there are things that need to be done. The limitation that we're having with the development on the ranger site right now is not addressed here. You're changing the maximum impervious area from 
fifty percent to seventy percent conceptually that sounds wonderful but the entire ranger side the easterly side of um, stafford road is in an overlay district for the watershed which maximizes development at ten percent impervious so if you have an eighty thousand square foot lot you're allowed to put eight thousand square feet of impervious which would mean your roof line your parking your walkways you need to address that overlay district because moving it from 50 to 70 percent actually harms my parcel because you're dropping the maximum height from 50 to 35 the best alternative i have is to go up but now i can't because you're dropping the height 15 feet and if you want me to meet the 812 pitch that the design standards have it becomes problematic one of the other questions I have that I think needs to be clarified is as Ken presented your retail you're rolling into less than 15,000 less than 40,000 I think we before it becomes a question you need to say is that the footprint is that the total building is it 15,000 square feet on the first floor and 15,000 feet on the second floor? Does that trigger 30,000 or does that trigger 15,000? Is residential on the first, on the second floor count towards that square footage or not? Um, and then for solicitor tights, Rhode Island General Law 452437, Andy, has the zone buster community residence. You cannot prohibit a community residence in any zone as is being proposed on page eight if residential is allowed in that zone so because apartment buildings are allowed in the tms and the pfd you cannot say no to community residents as i read that statute thank you anyone else uh, give it to nancy My name is Mark DeMello, 1041 Old Stafford Road. I just had a quick handout. I own the uh, Subway Plaza. Um, I'm in the process of uh, buying 15,000 square feet of land behind the building. And then it, once they develop the property, in that area right there, there's two more lots that would be in the general commercial area, which I, w I w really wanted to buy. The, I want to do like some sort of village setup of uh, small buildings where you can walk to. Um, <clears throat> individual, fancy, um, and you know, roughly spending a million and a half to two million dollars in the year 60, uh, 2000. Uh, 15 to 2017 uh, to create a little village concept by doing what they're doing now following the lot lines it would take that opportunity away and I kind of show that with the where on the left left hand side of the paper where I put I want to buy to create yep. a village style general commercial mm -hmm. area the so a if you guys don't do it, I still have a chance to back out, so I guess it wouldn't be a big deal, but I thought it'd be, you know, so living in Tiverton all my life, being a fourth generation, I think it would match the area really nice. Um, what they don't show uh, in this friendly district is the gas easement mm -hmm. that cuts through the property and the, on both sides, and then the, uh, the church land, the size of the land. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be Somebody was telling me from the church that's in a trust that can't be converted. 
I think it's a great idea what you guys are looking at to do with the flea market to, to convert that. My, I only had a suggestion, and I'll sit down at that point, was uh, if you went to the one more parcel to the right, which I have nothing to do with, but being a resident all my life, I think it would make it really nice creating that little downtown area, it would be the, the next parcel down to the east because it hits all the back of the properties all the way through. Uh, no, that's the one where uh, you can see it behind the church area, and right above uh, Indian Hill, I think Indian Hill Road. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm up with that. Whatever you can do to help, I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Hey, Mr. Buckland, which could you address some of these? Uh, starting with the, uh, the roof line and, and the one-story buildings, uh, in the uh, design standards for, for the pedestrian-friendly district, the idea is if you have a low building, we want uh, a raised roof, and if you have a higher building, you can have a, a flat roof. It's based on the, the dimension of the, of the building and the impact onto the, onto the street. Um, one of the things that you could do is, is still modify that, that roof to accommodate an HVAC, uh, the uh, uh, system on, on the rooftop, and that's, and that's often done as, as well. Um, we, don't, we, don't ne we didn't necessarily apply to the, the, the corporate standards of commercial development by the, the groups like McDonald's, the, uh, the national uh, retailers and, and uh, food interests. Uh, and uh, Burger King and Wendy's and whatever else that comes along. Uh, more the idea we're trying to create something that it looks looks and feels like Tiverton and has as a as a, a unique uh, uh, standard rather than rather than just a corporate uh, uh, anywhere uh, location. Uh, the traditional Main Street. Uh, there was the the point about. Uh, 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 snow removal, and I agree that snow <coughs> removal is a problem, but it's a problem that's been dealt with for hundreds of years in, in uh, New England. It's uh, something we, we live with as, as, a, uh, as a way to, uh, to deal with, uh, with uh, uh, the kind of climate that we have around here. Um, th that's not to say it isn't an issue, and in fact what we have is, is an allowance for not requiring a zero setback but having a variance of up to, to 10 feet uh, in, the front, uh, in the front yard to give some extra room in, in the front if necessary. <clears throat> um, there was the, uh, the question on the use chart as to special permits. Uh, there are uses that, that are not allowed. There are special permit uses. There are permitted uses, and uh, those, those vary uh, to uh, the district. Uh, we spend some time on thinking those through. Uh, if there's a, uh, a specific problem with, with one of them, of course, there's always the, the chance if, and in any case, in any of these cases, of if something comes forward that you see as, as a, a reasonable development project that makes a lot of sense to the town, the, the zoning is not immutable. It's not cast in stone. You can modify it again if you if you want for a project that makes the well, it makes a lot of sense and, and is and is kind of quality project that you want. So that that is one of the options you have available. Um, what the, the uh, there was a question on there was a point about the town's goals and investment uh, in the uh, sidewalks and and it goes to the right of way as well too, the, the improvements to the, uh, the travel way. And that is something that has to be done in, co in coordination with the state. What we were recommending is the design concept that was put forward in, in the form-based code in our, in our process be included in the comprehensive plan, the comprehensive community plan as an element. And that can be discussed. The comprehensive community plan is under discussion at this, at this time. There are two public meetings, one on Wednesday night, one on, on Saturday uh, during the day for uh, public input and comment to the, uh, the, the comp plan that can be uh, used for that purpose. Um, 
there was a the point about the uh, the design standards as to how they apply with uh, other overlay districts. Uh, we did not we did not consider the the overlay district for Stafford uh, Pond as as part of the uh, as part of the analysis that we did. This was strictly for the zoning district to replace the general commercial district that underlies that that. Um, uh, that uh, that overlay district in that that area, and in terms of the calculation of square feet, um, the fifteen thousand and forty thousand are gross leasable area, which means that it's one story or two stories or three stories or however many square feet of area is, is committed to commercial uh, use is calculated as part of that that uh, that uh, area calculation. Uh, so we we think that. There is, a, there is a measurement that has to be taken, and it's something that the, uh, the building commissioner is, is <coughs> to be responsible for, for reviewing, but it is possible to have that as, um, as, as part of the, uh, of the uh, planning process and the project uh, delivery and, and uh, permitting process. Okay. Anyone else from the public? <coughs> Joe Souza, 49 Hancock Street. Have we calculated how many businesses will be affected by this zoning change that will become, that were, that were uses at this time that were considered to be legal and now once we pass this they'll become pre-existing non-conforming uses? How many businesses? Hi, Kate Micho. Um, I'm the Planning Board's Administrative Officer. I'm also a resident of North Tiverton, and uh, I live right near um, the state line off of Main Road, and uh, I had the pleasure of working on this project. And we did indeed look at the existing businesses very closely. Uh, we went out, walked up and down the street, spoke to business owners, um, and spent a lot of time looking at this use table. One of the things we did try to do was to eliminate some of the special use permits in order to take some of the uncertainty out of the permitting process. Because we heard from business owners that the special use process was not helpful to them. Property owners in particular were looking for tenants to fill their businesses, their, their properties. And if you've been in North Tiverton, you know that there are plenty of buildings that do need tenants. And they could not take the gamble that a special use permit could be denied and that business would not be allowed to locate in that building. So what we tried to do is to say, yes, it's a permitted use, or no, it's not a permitted use, and to take that uncertainty out of the process. Certainly, there could be more special use permits, but we did not think that that would be helpful to the property owners and would not encourage the reinvestment that the owners want to make in the area, but that they can't justify without a definite answer as to whether or not something is going to be allowed to exist within that building. So certainly there, were, there was a lot of, of um, time and effort put into that particular issue, and there was a lot of time and effort put into minimizing the amount of existing, pre-existing non-conforming uses, and to bring more of the existing businesses into conformity with regard to the use table and specifically with regard to that district line to eliminate a lot of these existing structures that are split by the zone line currently. For example, the old Brooks building, uh, most of that building is currently within the residential district. Under the current proposal, that building would return to the commercial district um, as it historically was used. Um, so I guess that would be my answer is that I don't have a count as to how many businesses would um, become pre-existing non-conforming, but certainly the effort was made to make the businesses more conforming and to help the businesses and the property owners to uh, develop and to continue to exist in this community. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Anyone else from the public? Uh, 
Uh, Peter Monis, Captain Circle, Tiverton. I just want to make up the point that uh, on the Blissful Rock Corners, there's a overlying situation of the Stafford Pond. So you have a watershed district there, so we've got to comply to that too. So it's not an easy uh, you know, step to go and develop that area and because uh, we've got to also consider the watershed. We just can't use the commercial area and do anything we want in that area. And even residential is somewhat restricted now too. So please keep that in mind when you uh, deliberate uh, this ordinance. I think it's very good, and but you just can't put anything in the four corners, and especially on the uh, the western side, uh, the western side of Stafford Road. We got the watershed uh, overlay district there. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Good evening, Sally Black, um, 64 Broadview Drive. I'm really happy, Kate, to hear you say that you're going to try to make it more business friendly and easier for people to, I go to the zoning board month after month, and they have to obey the rules. The people sitting behind that table have to obey the rules that you people will make. The zoning you put forward, and when you made most of the town legal non-conforming years ago, I see it hurt people in North Tiverton that went from R50, 15 to R30, and R30 to 45 and so on. Not many people can afford R80. And the other people in this town have to be given the right. If they want to put a little pool on, a little deck, so they can enjoy their piece of paradise, they shouldn't be denied because they need a foot here or there. So I'm very happy to see this going along and to see that we're going to make it a livable community for the people that want to settle here and have been here for years and want to move in. I hear about all the state, all the problems we have, and we're losing population. Well, I want you all to know that Tiverton grew in population. Newport lost people, Middletown did, Portsmouth stayed the same. Tiverton grew by 550 people, one of the only communities in the state it's an amazing town. People want to come here. People want to live here. We have good schools. We have fabulous recreation. I was late. I just went to a baseball game someplace else. They didn't have dugouts. They didn't have a concession stand. My, my nieces and nephews were going, what are we going to do? <laughs> Tiverton gives so much to the people in every way. And they try with the senior center and every single thing through the budget process. These, this council worked so hard. I was there. I'm not getting off track because that's what we're all about. We try to give everyone what they need and give these people that are trying to settle here or expand here it's a good opportunity. And I thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Anyone else from the public? Third and final time, anyone from the public? Okay, the public portion is now closed. Hey, uh, Mr. Buckman, I have some questions. Um, Mr. DeMello brought up uh, over at, uh, in Bliss, you know, the possibility of expanding property that he already owns by purchasing more, which is behind it. How would that affect this proposed zoning? Uh, as I said, the, the, um, the, the way I think you should approach this is that if there's a development project that makes sense, come back and revisit the zoning and the zoning district boundaries as, as appropriate. The, uh, as to whether or not there can be a, 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 a change uh, uh, for the, the district boundaries <coughs> is something that Attorney Tights may be more appropriate to answer. <laughs> Standing in back. Okay, Mr. Tights? Yes. Um, the, the mic doesn't stretch that far on the other end, and I thought with this setting I'd be better if I stood up here. Um, I think uh, Mr. Buckland has set forth a good thing from a policy point of view that see what the development proposal is in the future, and if that's something that can be amended in the future. Um, from a legal point of view, unfortunately, even if you wanted to extend it, 
you can't because it hasn't been advertised. Mm -hmm. The boundaries of the zone change have been advertised um, and the 400 feet out with from those boundaries by certified mail. So while you could shrink it and eliminate parcels from the proposed zone change, you cannot add anything new that wasn't already um, received notice. You couldn't do that at this point. That would have to be a separate change. Um, the other question I think that perhaps it was the only other question I think that wasn't addressed was Mr. LeBeau's question. And I just want to say that, I mean, the question of whether a use is vested, which is a legal term when someone has proceeded far enough in reliance upon the existing zoning, is an individual determination based on a number of factors um, for individual property in each situation. Um, so I can't really comment it on it at this point, and I can't provide him advice that's for his attorney to provide. Um, and it would depend on where he is in the situation and not something that we can opine on tonight. Any other questions while I'm up here from the council? If I could just add one thing, if, if there is a certain district, and, and Mr. Tights can correct me if I'm, if I'm incorrect, um, but if there is an area where you don't feel that the new zoning is entirely appropriate, um, then you could shrink the district that's being proposed and the underlying district would apply. So in that instance where you're looking at Mr. DeMello's property, if you were to, um, to shrink back the pedestrian friendly district, then the underlying general commercial district is what would stay, stay in existence. Um, unless I'm incorrect. No, that's, that's okay, correct. that's how I understand it. I, I, I mean, are we, I mean, is that <coughs> how granular we need to be this evening in terms of yeah. no. looking at this? No, but if you want to, you can. Um, I also do want to, while I'm here, suggest two things. One is, um, I think Mr. Paglarini is correct about the um, community residences should be an allowable use the state law does require that they be allowed as of right in any district that allows residences. Um, and just overall, too, I would recommend, um, given the scope of this, that you, rather than vote tonight without a prepared um, motion, and I think the idea was to see what you want, and obviously none of you spoken yet as council members, um, but I would suggest and recommend the procedure of continuing the public hearing to one of the next two meetings that the council has on the 23rd or the 30th um, for preparation of a resolution and you could reopen the public hearing and take the vote on it at that time we'd have a draft resolution for you obviously based on your feedback here tonight okay. anything from the council oh, I just sorry. I just have a no. couple If I understood it correctly, Kate was saying it's still going to be 300 feet from the center, center of the street back? It could be. Because right now, if, 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 if it was voted on tonight and, um, on the west side, and they still just, just stood the same, wouldn't have to re-advertise it, I'm fine with that. Um, you know, basically, there would be no, have to re, you know, mail out um, the whole thing again, the whole process. And it would be nice to have it voted through tonight or on your next meeting, so you're not so some some developer don't have to come through and do the whole process again because that's not business friendly. You know, it'd be nice to have it where it's done that way and it, it could be done with, with the possibilities and have a, a nice future to that. Uh, well, I, I again, I'm 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 not sure, but just looking at the proposed zone and that extra portion it falls outside that and as mr. tight said we can shrink it right. but we can't expand it well, right now it's to the outside mm -hmm. I want to go I'm right it's right here right, right where it is it's right there right, right. that's that's oh, well, no, I think right now it's right here that's what this is where they right. want to bring it to mm -hmm. I'm just saying let it stay where it is mm -hmm. no but I'm saying but right now we cannot expand it unless we shrink this whole side Right. And say, okay, we're going to so not change it. Alone, then. If you guys didn't take a vote tonight, mm -hmm. they could stay that way. 
Well, if we don't take a vote, nothing changes right now. It's in there now. That, that small sliver? Yep, if you look at the... Sorry, I can't see. This guy is in general commercial. Right now, right now, here's the buffer from here to here. It's all the way across. The 300 feet all the way across. So, this is basically uh, 80,000 square feet, these two. You, you bring it in. I'm just asking the legal where it is. I'm not asking to expand the area. I'm just saying legal where it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just he, he just repeated what he was. <laughs> okay. Do we, do we have an existing map that is large enough that my eyes can see? <coughs> <coughs> uh, I'm not sure. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. oh, sir. Jay, you better, Jay, you better Jay. rise. <laughs> you better <go>. <laughs> <laughs> Move this way, Jay. <laughs> Municipal building. Oh, okay. So this this is the area he's talking about, that gray area mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. It is within the GC <coughs> zoning mm -hmm. uh, boundary. Whereas the the, uh, the proposal is to bring it back to that line and right. not include that, that gray area. Because they went to the property line. Correct. Anything from the council? Hang on, hang on. Want to use uh, Mike? Yes. Use both of them. In stereo, <laughs> phonic here. Um, so my question is, I suppose, <coughs> if this zoning amendment were adopted, that parcel would stay in the general commercial district, and the the front, the, the parcels with frontage on Stafford Road would be in the neighborhood. I'm sorry, the pedestrian friendly. Pedestrian friendly, whatever it's called. I'm sorry. What's that destination? What is, what is, why is that a problem? I, I'm trying to understand this. If that's state and commercial. Oh. And you can use this one. <laughs> <coughs> I was under the impression that they were taking away that general commercial from the 300 foot setback and following the uh, what I was told, it, it followed all the property lines. So yeah. So but what what still. this this. If I'm not mistaken, this portion will revert to general commercial. If, if you choose. If you choose. Well, and that is a problem why, I'm asking. That would as long as you, if you choose to keep it general commercial, I'm fine. There's no choice of keeping it general commercial. It's by default. If we eliminate, if we eliminate it from the zone and change the zone, it goes back to the zone. Right. The way we had proposed... Oh, sorry. It can't be nothing. It can't be in a... Right, and the way it was advertised, that strip would, would go to R60 with the rest of the residential parcel that it's part of. That's, that's the way it was advertised. That's the issue. So, but what you could do is you could, you could shrink that proposed district and then you, the GC would, would go back. Um, you know, that, that small gray area that we saw would, would be GC. And if he merged that into his parcel, then the part of the zoning di ordinance where split lots, the zoning district can um, move 50 feet for a lot that's bisected by a zoning district. If he did administrative subdivision and merge those two lots, then that pedestrian friendly district would automatically bump 50 feet further. Um, so basically he would end up with what he was asking for anyway. Okay. I'm glad somebody understood that because yeah. I'm yeah. still confused. <laughs> I'm still well, it's, going to be, it's still a moving target, but we'll get yeah. there. Okay. Okay. Um, anyone else from the council? I just have a couple of questions, and I just want to clarify something that I think I heard is that the new zoning and the design specs really only apply when something is developed and or redeveloped on a parcel, right? So something that's there right now, hypothetically, we pass this tonight, tomorrow doesn't mean everyone's got to 
you know, start digging in and changing. It's only when the parcel is developed and or redeveloped, correct? Okay. Now, and Andy, I appreciate the, the, the legal kind of proceeding in terms of vesting and whether something is um, to a certain point or not. My question is, um, is is there any sort of I, I guess legal precedent above and beyond that that kind of sets some guidelines or best practices for how to handle a situation such as this um, and I'm talking specifically of Mr. LeBeau's project Mr. Tights Oh, sorry, you're right here. I'm looking down the table thinking you're, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you um, take us out of our element and, and we're totally lost. Sorry, yeah, yes, that's right. Um, and I just felt too alone back there, even, even with Nancy and Matt to keep me company. Um, to answer your question, no, th this is a policy decision of yours. Um, it's a separate legal decision, which is really not your issue, how far along he is. It's a policy decision of yours, just as the question with Mr. DeMello. Do you want to pull this back out and leave it in the general commercial? It's the same thing with Mr. LeBeau. What do you want to do about it? The, the further question of if you do it and it does become a different zone neighborhood business and would otherwise require a special use permit, that's a separate thing that's really not before you tonight. So it's really what you should look at as your policy decision on you know, where you do it. That's why you have the public hearings here, so that people have a chance to come up and say, no, you made a mistake with my property, or please don't do this or that. And as I said, other than expanding it beyond what you've notified, you can make these changes to it. You can pull it back um, or change things on the edges or change the use table elements as well, as we talked about with the community residents. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tice, I, I do have a question. <coughs> The, the concepts that I've liked so far, or the, the, the key words, the buzzwords, have been words like business friendly and, and livable. This is what I'd like to make sure. I, I, I'd like the, t the average resident of Tiverton or somebody who's got plans for something in Tiverton to be able to say, Gee, this is a great idea. It would look great on North Main, uh, on Main Street, or it would look great at the Four Corners. But it just doesn't quite fit in. The other buzzword I would like some assurance on, my buzzword would be, with the others that I've mentioned, common sense. I is there a way or a <coughs> process of, of making sure from a legal viewpoint that we have enough common sense in this planning concept that's being put together that we're really going to be able to address these issues. Uh, I remember what north, the north end of Tiverton looked like 50 years ago. And in all honesty, it hasn't changed much in 50 years. I would have one approach if I knew, gee, this is the plan that's going to go into effect next year or next week or next month or 10 years from now. I, I, don't, I don't believe that that's going to happen. I think things will come in in dribs and drabs. You'll have a basic concept that people can use. But when all, and that's going to drag out for years, if not decades. Uh, but what you do need are people that have common sense and a plan and a concept that can employ that common sense. That's what I'd like to get some assurance from. Uh, that yes, if I look at a, somebody comes to me and says, here's what I'd like to do. And I say, wow, that's absolutely great. Let's see if we can get it done as quickly as possible. Is everything in play with the concept that we're putting together and the plan that we're putting together that we can work with that type of prospect? Well, now you've done it. You asked me a question about the philosophy of zoning. Yeah, I, so I, I should I, be I, able yeah, to I, answer I, it in the next half hour or so. Yeah. But let me get to your first thing. 
the common sense part, the guarantee, no. That's that, with the yeah, seven of you. I, the guarantee. That, that, I, I that, didn't that's expect why, the guarantee. Yeah. No, but 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 I'm serious. That is that is where it is. It lies with the seven of you directly and indirectly. It lies with you directly in the sense that you're looking at it and you're seeing, you know, is this the vision you want? Is this, mm -hmm. you know what the comprehensive plan is? You've already been involved with that in the past. You're involved with it on an ongoing basis. Is this the vision of what you want to see for these areas of, of Tiverton as a way to encourage the commercial development and broaden the tax base? You know, do you, do you think it's going to work? Um, if someone does come up with a better idea, or what one of you thinks is a better idea, um, you're not precluded from amending the zoning again. Yeah. There's no limits on it. You can come back in six months or six years mm -hmm. and have a new zoning amendment if somebody's got a better idea. Mm -hmm. um, the indirect part is with your zoning board, um, because you appoint them. And Hopefully you're appointing the five members and two alternates with common sense, mm -hmm. and they look at it and they apply the law. And if it's something that you know really does fit in, and it's just a small alteration or something like that, but fits in with um, the the theme and the um, the proper meaning of the ordinance and the comprehensive plan, then that's what you got your zoning board there for that kind of small relief. So, um, or likewise, a special use permit that the zoning board will look at it and say, well, okay, does this fit in with what we are looking for on the overall um, zoning ordinance and comprehensive plan? So that's, I guess, my answer to you, that it, it can be changed. You're not locked in stone here, and, and you're the common sense element going forward. Now, so to just step aside and- So and what you're saying, though, Andy, in part, is that it's, it's sort of an evolving vision. Right. If well, you're looking at it from my viewpoint, <coughs> I, I, I can remember, as I say, remember Tiverton 50 years ago. I can remember when I was going to college what North Tiverton looked like. And you know in 50 years it hasn't changed at all. If anything, I, I hate to say this, I hope I'm not offending anybody, but it might have gotten a little worse, especially in the business section. Uh, maybe that's all due to taxes and, and God well, knows what else. Um, but I, ju I just, I would like to know that I have a vision of what Tiverton should look like, what where we're going, the direction we should be going in, and I, and I think you've hit on the right concept. That is, <coughs> what we're going to have to rely on. Uh, it, it becomes the people, whether they have that vision and whether they can, they're using common sense in, in, in trying to get us moving in the right direction. Let, let me. That's what it comes to. Let me tell you. I don't think it's so much the vision that's evolving, although the vision will change over time. I think, uh, because in a way, much of what we're doing is actually going back. We're going back to a sort of traditional New England models there and the buildings close to the street and whatnot. Um, it's actually, the, we realized those older ways were actually better than the big acres of parking and the store set a couple of hundred feet back behind all the parking. Um, but I do think you have to establish it. You have to set the goal and say, this is what we want. And maybe it's going to take many years as commercial buildings have 30 and 40 year life cycles and they get rebuilt and development happens and we go through economic booms and busts. But I think you do have to set that vision and set it as a goal. You have to set the bar somewhat high. Um, and let me give you a, an example. In the town of Bristol back in the late 80s, early 90s, comprehensive plan called for let's have a boardwalk along the water. Let's have a thing so you can walk all the way along the waterfront in Bristol. And did it happen overnight? No. Has it happened yet? Not quite, but it's almost all there. And the last remaining development parcel, the Robin Rugg Mills, which have master plan approval for conversion to residential and mixed use, um, Part of that approval is the last step of that boardwalk, the last link in connecting. So if you set the bar, you set the goal in the beginning, eventually you have a good chance of getting it. The city of Newport never put that in their comp plan very strongly, never put it in their zoning. The city of Newport has a hodgepodge of little public rights of way where you can get out from one wharf and can't get to the next one until you go all the way back out in the street and up and down. 
They never put it there as a clear vision and said, as we're developing, we want to see this here. And it didn't happen. So that's why I, I happen to personally think, um, you know, I, mean, I wasn't the one who drafted it, Mr. Buckland was, <coughs> the planning board and through a lot of input from the public. Um, but based on my experience and knowledge and professional experience as a planner too, I think this is a good vision, a good plan, and I don't think it's too high a bar for Tiverton either. I think it's a good goal to aim for. And it might be 20 years before you see it really realized, but if you don't do it now, if you don't start sometime, you're never going to see it even in that 20 years. So, so I, I think essentially, and, and I'm trying to follow you, and my own thinking is developing on this. I, I think at best what I can hope for is that through a comprehensive plan like this, we've removed <laughs> as many obstacles as possible to people recognizing what their vision is. Yes. Is that the way to? I, th I would agree. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Tice. That was an excellent presentation. And, and if I could just add one point that, you know, sometimes when you look at these things so often, you, it's, it's in your head and so you don't say it and you assume that everyone in the room knows it. Um, the design guidelines that are in this document are guidelines and they're not, they're not regulations. Um, there's a regulatory aspect to the amendment, which is the use table, the dimensional table, and the map. And then there's the design guidelines, which is that vision. Um, and they're meant to be a guide to allow the market and to allow the, the property owners to take these guidelines and to make them fit their particular needs. Um, and the way that this evolved is, you know, I have worked for the planning board for almost 13 years, and I've seen a, a number of, of developers come before the planning board, and a lot of times they say, what do you want me to do? Just tell me what you want, and I'm going to do it. And this way, there's a document, and it's a full set of guidelines, and before they even get to the board, we can put this in their hands and say, this is what the town would really like to see. Adopt it the way you need to for your property, and make it work for your business, but this is the vision that, that we have for the commercial development in these areas of town. And I really, honestly, I think that, that developers will appreciate that honesty instead of them trying to come up with an idea and then they, maybe some people like it, maybe some people don't, it's very subjective. This way, you have guidelines in place and everybody knows, everybody's working off the same document. So I just wanted to make that point that the, the guidelines are not regulatory, but they are <coughs> guidelines. Anyone else from the council? <clears throat> yeah, I just have a couple things to discuss. Uh, it came up tonight that um, one of the goals was to eliminate special use permits. That's correct. Just going over quickly the use table. Uh, just quickly counting how many times uh, an existing permitted use changed to a special use permit mm -hmm. was roughly it creates basically 25 special use permits. And I'm counting each uh, new zone. So if there was one in pedestrian friendly and a neighborhood business, I counted those both as being a created new special use permit. And if you look at the ones that were already existing special use permit, uh, ones that were changed to a permitted use was 11. So our delta right now is roughly 14 in creating new special use permits. The other ones that did change were actually a not permitted use. And I didn't have time to count all those quickly. This is a, a basic mm -hmm. looking at it over the high level. And I'm, probably someone else probably did it a little more in detail than I did. <clears throat> now, uh, one thing I wanted to also uh, probably talk about was a while ago we had this meeting initially, I think it was with the planning board. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yep. And I, I believe we discussed at the Bliss Four Corners possibly extending it out further at that time. Mm -hmm. Would that be prior to needing re-advertisement of increasing the zone? Yes. Okay. And I noticed that uh, that still has not, well, I, I don't see it done in the, the maps that we have mm -hmm. now. So I was just wondering, was there an issue with possibly doing that, extending it out to where, uh, for example, where Old Stafford and Stafford meet, there's a small community center there, and there's also Tiverton Sign Shop. Mm -hmm. 
and I think no business side of that. We talked about extending it out to that area as well as the old uh, Dairy Dip Glenmaz building as well, because I believe that's not included in this map now. I could address that if you'd like. The planning board did discuss that um, when they had their, their meeting on this, and they did look specifically at, at those lots, um, and they did ask the Cecil group for an opinion on those lots. And the Cecil group um, did not recommend including those lots in this particular district, uh, just because they were separated from um, the contiguous district that was being reviewed. Uh, the Cecil group specifically looked at lots that are existing as general commercial and not as pre-existing non-conforming residential. Um, but the, what the planning board had recommended was to do further study on those lots, and um, perhaps they should be in the general commercial district. Um, so the planning board actually just at the last meeting I distributed maps to them and aerial views and uh, property cards from the assessor's records to them for those specific lots and, and they're reviewing those lots at this time. Um, but since they weren't part of the original scope of the project, the planning board did not recommend including them in this project. But there's something going forward. Yes, yes, they have um, a, a full packet of information on those properties <coughs> has been distributed to them for their review and to start discussing those properties. Is there, is there expected some ETA on a decision possibly? Um, I would expect it would probably be on the next agenda to start talking about it. The planning board chairman uh, sets the agenda. Uh, but it was just at the, at the last meeting that the planning board members received that packet of information to start reviewing. Thank you. And I guess the last thing I just want to uh, bring up is <clears throat> we've heard people who are, have, already have existing properties and we haven't really discussed someone who may possibly want to purchase a property uh, that might be available. So let's say uh, someone wants to put a use in, I, I can't think of a good example right now off the top of my head, that's in a zone that has a building available, but it's not permitted going forward if, if this passes. But they would have to actually purchase um, that property where it would be permitted, but it may not be the ideal location that they want. So it was brought up that, yeah, we can always change the ordinance and so on and so forth, but uh, as far as I have observed myself, that's taken quite a bit of time to complete that process. And sometimes time is sensitive and some, and we've had, I, I believe we've had some issues where some businesses have just got tired of waiting and just moved, moved on somewhere else. And I like to possibly avoid that type of situation, my, my personally, myself. I, uh, I'm going to ask the same question. I'm going to ask the same question. No. Um, I'm going to talk a couple about <coughs> two separate things, and one is, is to tap into some, some of the points that uh, Jim made about special use permits, and some of them are um, specific questions about uses that are in the, in the, in the use table. And I'll, I'll start with the more um, wonky and specific uses. There are two uses. I mean, you look through you look through this zoning code and the use table and, and the old use table versus the new use table, there are some substantial improvements. Um, and some of that has to do with the example I, I'm thinking of is the retail, whereas we used to have very specific uses for retail. Um, grocery, but not specialty foods and um, that sort of thing. Whereas now it's just generally retail. But then we have some very, very specific uses. And it just stood out to me that we have two uses. Um, let me find them. On page, one's on page 10. It's, it's letter J. Other open commercial recreation use. And that's under uh, open recreation uses, it's a special use permit. It's always been a special use permit. It, it, the recommendation is it continue to be a special use permit. I don't know of a definition of other open recreational uses, um, of open commercial recreational uses. And it, it just sort of triggered something in my, my mind that we have a very um, subjective category that someone has to make a decision upon 
whether it be, and in, in, in I suppose typically it would be if it's an as of right use that isn't specifically outlined, it would be the zoning official. And if it's a special use permit, the zoning board of review would um, opine on that. Are we doing ourselves a disservice having a use like that that is not specifically defined, that is so broad and open to interpretation and not having a, a definitive guideline as to what that encompasses because I think what that means is you know like tennis courts and I don't know what else I don't, I don't, I don't know what it is my head but <clears throat> do you understand what I'm saying Ken yes I do and and uh, you're talking about section six which is open recreation uses yes. uh, as a general category under the use table and there are, are very specific numbers of, of uses. The, the golf course, a, a driving range, miniature golf course, a public park, a bathing beach, a commercial swimming pool. With those specific uses, there may be something that works with the, the outdoor recreational use that is, has commercial potential that uh, would be appropriate to consider. And so procedurally, what this allows is that the, <coughs> the Board of Appeals can take that, that opportunity to actually look at a specific use and have that opportunity to say as to whether or not it's appropriate for, for the district and under what conditions it would be, it would be permitted. And that would, that would be the special, the special permit um, use for, the, uh, for that particular uh, option. Okay. I, I, I think either that means that it's a use of exclusion or it's a use we can't quite imagine? Is that possible to, is that, does that make you, you, sense? We can't I'm quite imagine it. We can't list it specifically and say yes or no on it. Okay. And so we're, we're given an opportunity for somebody to come in and say, okay. I, have a great op right. I have a great use here, whatever it might makes, be. That and one makes sense to me. So we have another one, which is under section eight. It's um, D, letter D. It's the indoor commercial, which is the, the opposite of our our outdoor commercial recreation, which is now indoor commercial recreation. It's on and page 11. Yeah, yeah, it's on the following page <coughs> under section 8. So we have special use permits in two of those um, districts in and in a, in a as of right permit in one of them, uh, the pedestrian friendly district. Um, that one doesn't seem to have nearly as much compelling argument for the um, use of exclusion because there aren't very many listed. But I think I can imagine what indoor commercial recreation is. Because that seems like a blanket. That's, there, there's not a, a checklist there. There's not the, the golf course, the bathing beach, the tennis courts, the driving range, et cetera, that wouldn't fit into that category. There are no categories. It's theaters, taverns, restaurants. Um, I think the obvious one would be a, a video game center. Uh, would be an example of an indoor commercial recreation use. Well, that's my point, is I think we can all list a bunch of things we think are indoor commercial recreation. Um, and on, in this instance, we're setting up two districts to be sort of determined, those uses to be determined or opined on by the Zoning Board of Appeals and one district to be opined on by the zoning official. It seems like we're inconsistent in that approach. Um, and I, for one, would like to understand that a little bit better. The, the reason for having it permitted within the, uh, the pedestrian-friendly uh, destination district was because that was a more intensive commercial use and, and, allowed, and allows more, uh, more opportunity, more use uh, potential uh, as a, a more, the most intensive of the uh, commercial uses. It was, it was set as a special permit for the traditional Main Street and the neighborhood um, business district because it was, it was thought that they would not necessarily conform to the use, um, the use criteria that we were setting as goals for those, for those districts. Okay. I think we're going to circle back to that one in a minute um, because I'm going to collect my thoughts on it a little bit. The, the other point I wanted to make was about special use permits. I absolutely hate special use permits. Um, I don't know if I've said that before. I'm sure I have. Uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, a special use permit 
by sort of default really should be compelling. Um, and I don't necessarily understand some of these. Uh, and, and I just maybe need to be uh, informed more by your thought process and the, the, the uh, planning board's thought process and what information you found from the public in some of these. <coughs> it's not going to be too long of a conversation, but we, we're on page eight at the bottom with convalescent rest and nursing homes, ret retirement and assisted living facilities, and almost ex exclusively across the board, there's special use permits and were special use permits. Um, when I say I, I think there ought to be a compelling reason why you require a special use permit, I think I, I understand that a special use permit is, is, a, is a tool used to ensure uh, reasonable protection for the utility and the uses in the neighborhood and you want to make sure that these uses are cooperative and they work um, and it's, it's not a totally outrageous uh, leash that we, we let uses on. But I, I, so uh, that's why I say sort of a, a rest home, nursing home, retirement, residence, assisted living facilities to me, at least in the natural, we look at the natural landscape, most of those, at least in these smaller districts, would be of, of, of relatively small scale and would, at least to me, appear to be not terribly intrusive. So what's the argument for disallowing, or, well, I say effectively disallowing, I, I, would, I would argue that it discourages a great number of, of potential developers or potential uh, property owners right off the bat. I mean, it's not a quantifiable number, but it certainly is a deterrent for some people. Uh, an interesting discussion on, on the philosophy of special permits and um, uh, in an aging uh, population, the, uh, the idea of, of retirement uh, rest, uh, rest homes as, as an option in, within the, uh, the use table. Um, in the special permit, from my perspective, is used when it's a use that you would accept under certain conditions. There's, there's certain mitigating factors that are necessary to apply to allow that use to be, to be uh, permitted within, within, your, uh, within your community. Um, and so you have that opportunity to actually look at the specifics of the, of the, uh, of the project and make a determination as to how that or, or what, what conditions should be applied to make sure that it conforms with, with the, uh, the, uh, the, the direction of it, the, uh, the, the policy and, and the goals of the town. In the case of the, of the convalescent rest and nursing home and retirement residence, the, uh, uh, the listing of, of uh, those uses here, we took it from the basis that the existing use table had it as a special permit use and, and played off of that. And in fact, you're right that in a lot of cases, these would fit quite nicely in, within, the, within the area. Uh, but they wouldn't necessarily be exactly the right kind of use if you are trying to get a, uh, a viable um, commercial center. Um, and, that's, and that's the key. Uh, the, the, uh, the activity and the use that you wanted to, uh, to have played through in, in those commercial areas this isn't the only place to put a convalescent home. We're, we're only looking at one part of the use table and one part of the, of the regulations of the, of, the, uh, of the town. And there are other locations where these uses could be, could be put in. And so we're looking at a, a small subset. We're, we're playing off the idea that the existing st standard for review uh, within the community is for a special permit. So that in these new districts, we're also looking at, at uh, special permit. Okay, so I guess the second, and, and I, I, I buy that. That, that that's, a, that's a good argument, I like that. So, um, but kind of continuing on with that, we have hospital, medical, center, and clinic on page nine. It's, it's right smack in the middle of the page, geographically, e, letter E. Those are also special use permits. And if we're talking about um, sort of mixed use districts, at least some of these are, and we have the opportunities for both commercial retail service providers on the first floor, 
residential uses on the second floor. We have a more dense neighborhood in the north end, more pedestrian uh, oriented, fewer cars, less access to public transportation in Tiverton since we have very limited access to public transportation. One might logically concur that a small medical clinic in the north end isn't totally outrageous um, to think of and would be, I think, um, right at home, I suppose. So, I, one, one of the, um, the idea of a medical office makes a lot of sense as, another, as, an, op as an option available for the, uh, the commercial districts. Um, I think one of the, 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 the um, considerations was the idea of a hospital. Um, and, and this goes to, well, we I didn't cer correct. I, cer I certainly think that, I think that, that we're, we're talking, when I look at, at this table and uses, I don't look at a, a broad canvas, a blank canvas that, is, that, is, that are these districts. I look at what is physically possible, what is economically reasonable, and what is likely to happen. Um, just from market dynamics, and I don't believe anybody thinks that putting a hospital um, on State Avenue is logical um, or economically viable or just physically possible endeavor. I think uh, in a world where certainly we have an aging population um, to think about, we have a, a lot of motivation towards um, community-centered uh, medicine. I mean, you see these small um, community medical centers popping up all over the place. They're small. They're uh, you know, they're not a hospital. They're not a primary care. They're 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 halfway in between, and they really do serve a, a very good purpose in society. And I'm not going on about you know what we should be doing societally in North Tiverton, but I go back to. I really need to be convinced why, a special, why we're prohibiting for all intents and purposes or causing people to go through additional, oftentimes arduous, um, um, whatever you call processes because we, we're trying to accomplish something. So I, I, I get that. But some of these I don't, some of these I don't get. And I, some of these I think we can do ourselves perfectly uh, a very good service by, by eliminating some of these special use permits, S especially when we have multiple layers um, of review on these sorts of things. We have, you know, we're talking about taverns in the, in, on the next two pages or something, where there is not only a special use permit required, but also a license. And, you know, we, we've got layers of of the town government that you really, if you want to use the word hoops that one must jump, jump through, that is an, an additional hoop. Um, I, I guess that's all I'm saying. I, I, I just think special use permits are, um, whenever possible, we ought to try to do without them. And especially with the way the state of Rhode Island has viewed special use permits and non-conforming uses in the past. Um. Uh, to, uh, to point out under, um, on page 10, under section 7, office uses, B is, includes professional and, and general offices. It has examples of real estate insurance and others, et cetera. Uh, it, it is a possibility, and those are permitted uses. Uh, within the uh, within all the districts that it could be that uh, a medical office could fit in that uh, criteria I mean couldn't we just separate it out I mean sounds like a you did. Sep <laughs> well I, I, I think what's happening is that some of the uses are so specific you know that that you're looking at it and you're saying there's no room Again, it, it would have to be by special use, which I think we're trying to get away from. And I think some of these areas, especially when you get into the, uh, the, the North Tiverton portion or even in the pedestrian-friendly area, that those type of uses make sense in a heavily congested area where people are going to be drawn to. So if they can go to a, a walk-in 
clinic. We're, never, we're not going to have a hospital in town, but a you know walk-in clinic or some sort of therapy place. Those places make sense in those areas, but we're making it as a special permit, and I think that's that's the things that that I think uh, I'm having issues with. Me too. You know, and and just just to go a little bit further, I mean, we are a waterfront town, and we have a restriction on boat rentals, tours, charter fishing, and similar uses, right across the board. Now, if somebody were to come in in, in a pedestrian-friendly area, uh, you know, Four Corners area, or even on Main Road, and want to rent kayaks, they're not going to be able to, because it's a non-permitted use, which to me doesn't make sense in a waterfront community. I, I think in that case, one of the uh, considerations was that it was waterfront recreation business. And there is no waterfront in these general commercial districts, although your point is well taken. Pretty close. Because of yeah. the way yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah. I mean, it's not like they're going to have to, you know, take a plane. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the idea that it previously under the general commercial, it was, it was, it was a, a no, it was not allowed as a use, no. these boat rentals. Uh, I, we assume that your your decision previously had been that this was specifically for waterfront and not for the general commercial district but that it, 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 we we spent hours on on this table going back and forth on the, on which ones would be special permits and which one would be allowed and, and which ones would be not allowed and there are some judgment calls that are be that have been made in here and you certainly have that opportunity to come back and say this, these choices were, should be, uh, should be amended in some way. So the other question I had, and it's, it's, it's less of a, well, it's a question because I need you to, I need your expertise. When we talk about uses like, and we're on page 12, gasoline filling stations, including retail sales and auto and truck sales and repairs, um, what I, I think about that use and they are not permitted in two of the districts they are per, their special use permit in the pedestrian friendly the question I have is when you have a use like that that is not permitted in cert, in certain districts that would either they're close by or they're in those districts currently. Is there typically a motivation to continue to perpetuate that use indefinitely so that you maintain your non-conforming, pre-existing non-conforming use status? Is that, is that a, a market phenomenon that happens? Because you can't replicate the use next door, you continue to utilize it? A absolutely. Forever. I, especially those th that are difficult to cite. Yeah, such as a, a gasoline station, mm -hmm. that that the um, the continuation of those uses is, is is the way that they are are uh, maintained as a use within the community. Otherwise, they're they're forced out in, so, in many zoning districts. So, what is the impact then on? So, what is what what, what I'm trying to find out, what I'm trying to understand is in a use like that where it's it's, it's a, i would say it's sensitive use it's storage of gasoline it's repair of vehicles that th these things you know over time can um especially gas stations they have a finite life expectancy before they need to be kind of turned over and rehabbed and the tank's been pulled and does perpetuating non-conforming uses like that instead of allowing new a new site for such a use does that would it would it would it be better to allow more flexibility for relocating uses like that, or is it better to maintain the old use as for? I, it, I'm thinking mechanically mm -hmm. that the, that you you continue to have this gas station that was built in the 1930s, and it is the footprint of an old timey gas station, and it is it, it is not going to expand, and you're not going to get. I mean, one of the I guess benefits is you're not going to get these enormous gas stations next door with Dunkin Donuts and a, and a supermarket and a hair salon and whatever else they stick in them nowadays that are three times the footprint 
Um, but do we do? But do we do we benefit from that from those non-conforming uses continuing to be non-conforming uses, ultimately for ever, forever potentially, because there are no um, no alternatives, or there are few alternatives. Uh, of course, the commercial uses exist because of the, of the uh, market that's available to them. Sure. I mean, uh, some people complain about the number of gas stations in, in, their, in their commercial areas. Some people complain about the number of banks in their commercial areas. The reason why they are there is because people are, are coming to that location. It's an easy way to get your gasoline. It's an easy way for you to do your banking, mm. whatever it might be. And, and so it, it's these commercial uses are citing based on on the market that's uh, that's available to them and their success in that in that particular market. So they will remain so long as that market opportunity is is there. Um, your choice as to whether or not you'd want to say um, encourage them in some other location, you can zone areas for gas stations, you can zone areas for for commercial where it is residential. Mm -hmm. The question is you, where you are you going to do that? Have, have you gone through a process, a public process, to say this is where we want our our, uh, our car dealer, all our, of our car dealerships will be all in the same, the, the same auto mile, the, you know, how, how that's how that may be done in other communities, as a as a way to uh, to cluster uses within a, a certain area, and you can do that. One of the one of the things you can't do by zoning is change the market. You can't force a gas station to come in. You can't force it to leave. The market does that. Certainly. I, I think I'm just, I'm sensitive to, the, to it because there are uses like the like gas station where they can be tricky to cite um, and tricky to plan for, but are in, I think, a society that is, um, highly reliant on automobile transportation, quite a necessity. Um, and I, I know just the market can flip the other way as well. And, and I guess I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that there, there will be a day in Tiverton that we have no gas stations, um, but it's certainly something we have to think about because I'm sure there were plenty of towns and cities that didn't think that they wouldn't have any gas stations, and now they don't. Um, and market forces, while a gas station was a, a, a profitable use, there was a higher and better use for that parcel of land, and now um, you can't buy gasoline in the city of Boston. Um, that's an example, and, and <coughs> it sounds like a stupid problem, but it's a problem, um, and people are uh, trying to figure out what to do about it, and and that might and that's and that's something you can discuss in your comprehensive plan as well, and and it, it's a it's a reasonable expectation that you're going to want some mix of uses mm. that is going to make the livability that much better within the community, and it it could include gas stations or it could include electric vehicles charging stations. Yeah, and right. And that, and that is your opportunity to uh, identify those uses and to include them as, as part of your overall mm. sustainable development and quality of life. And uh, just one last comment. The reason I'm asking and talk, trying to talk about this is that I think a lot of people, and I think I, before I had much experience with this kind of conversation, looked at uh, non-conforming uses or making a use non-conforming um, as a way to try to steer what the future would be of that parcel. And I think it happens sometimes. I think a residential flipping to commercial is one of those things that is a logical trajectory. But on commercial, Specific uses sometimes, like we talk about these gas stations, or, or a, a specific use that is going to be that use, no matter if you make it a non, you make it a, a non-conforming use, make it a special use permit that's going to be or not, you know, eliminate the use entirely from the even even the lexicon of our text. That use may continue to be there indefinitely. Um, so I, I don't want us to lose sight of the non-conforming uses that will continue to be 
part of our community for a long time. That's correct. I, I think one of the uh, one of the points being made previously was this idea: one way towns start to approach to try to control the density of development is keep raising the minimum lot mm -hmm. size and making a whole series of, of, of smaller lots non-conforming right. within within a uh, within a district. I philosophically, as a planner, I, I don't recommend that at all. I think that's yes. that's inappropriate use of of zoning as a way to uh, to manage uh, density. Thank you. Um, I just have a question for Kate. Um, I know we booked the town, uh, the auditorium here because we expected a lot of people instead of having it at the town hall. Um, just a question on the certified mail. Um, how many did we send out and how many did we get returned? I don't have an exact count on the returns. Uh, the clerk's office has been handling that. We sent out somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,160 certified notices. Um, so it was everyone within the proposed districts and within 500 feet of the property line to those proposed districts. Um, I have been going through the, um, the returns. Most of them are unclaimed. Um, I, I don't have an exact count though on how many how many um, envelopes were came back. Any idea like twenty five percent, fifty percent? I don't. Maybe Mrs. Mello has. They, they've been coming to Mrs. Mello's office, so they've been coming in action. Process. The process takes a while with the um, post office the way it runs, but yes, I'd say uh, we probably have. Close to 50 percent, and wouldn't you say this? This stacks of them. I mean, I haven't counted them either, but there's ample return that have been signed and returned. I don't want to say exactly 50 percent or 40 percent, okay. but there is stacks of them. Okay, it would be good. And some continue. people have come into the town hall, looked at the maps that uh, Kate had up there, and seemed to uh, be acceptive of it and didn't. I think most of the questions that I got or people that came into me was because they didn't quite understand it, but as soon as they saw the map and the post that she had set up, oh, that was like people from Star Woods and mm -hmm. stuff and that whole thing that it affected there as opposed to just the Main Street area. So we did have a few come in. I don't know how many Kate had to come in, but the clerk's office had a few. Okay. Um, I think from the perspective we want to be business friendly in this town. And I think that for the industrial park, it, it's pretty easy because it's a blank slate. And it has uh, now a streamlined process um, in place. It's been uh, subdivided. There's been a lot of work on that. And, and, and it make, it's easy because it's, there's nothing there. So life is easy. You can have the use table and you can you can be specific and and say this is what we want in that park but when you look at main road or bliss four corners it's much more difficult because there's already existing uses there's already buildings there there's already homes there it's built out how many properties are are there uh, in on main road that are not built up there's one across from Pacasset, uh, the Pacasset School. There's the, the one that Ms. LeBeau is, is trying to develop. There's a few down at the bottom near Little Bear. Uh, there might be a few other ones, but there's not much to build out. Uh, Blissful Corners, that's the first I ever heard uh, with Ms. Mello mentioning the subway area, subway plaza. Um, but there isn't that much to build out it's it's all existing buildings so it makes it very difficult to have that vision there's there's time that goes by and you have businesses that haven't been they've been empty for a year and if they're on a Longer. an r30 lot then they revert to r30 so they lose their business uh, that uh, happened that happens in a, quite a few places 
uh, around town where there was a, a Dairy Queen or Glendale, whatever it was called. Dairy Dip. Glen Dairy Mas. Dip. <laughs> Glen Mas. And it can't be a, a ice cream place anymore because it's been out of business. And that piece of property is just sitting there developing weeds. The building yeah. is falling apart. And I think it still has potential. It could have had potential as, a, as still as a business if it was allowed to, but it wasn't. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fine line that you have to draw between, you know, should these things, these non-conforming uses continue um, they they slowly roll away and, and disappear and then you're left with property that is not easily redeveloped or uh, rehabbed and tonight that there's been quite a few uh, concerns that have been brought up uh, certainly the subway plaza the um, indoor recreation uh, commercial indoor recreation and then the, the ranger school and I think these folks need answers and in order to proceed with any any plans that they they may have they they need some certainty otherwise they're just out there hanging and and hanging might result in it's not allowed or they might have to have a special use permit and we all know the special use permit is is arduous as as Brett mentioned, as well as costly. And even if you put all that expense into it to go to the zoning board to have it reviewed, you may get the answer of no. And you've spent hundreds of dollars trying to get uh, a special use permit. And it's not guaranteed. Um, so to me, I, I want to be friendly to business. I want it to make it a little bit easier for them but I, I know we have roadblocks in the way and I know Mr. Buckland mentioned that you know if the zoning is wrong and an opportunity comes along that we can modify zoning uh, that's an option and I look at that answer and I say well that's a that's a wrong answer <laughs> because we know what we, a business has to go through just look at Sousa Road and Caprionato in order for them to proceed with a project, they ha there has to be comp plan changes, they have to be zoning changes, that they have to jump through hoops in order to accomplish that project. And I personally think that would be an excellent project for the town. It would bring, bring in, uh, it would be a destination and, and have uh, revenue come into the town. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I think the, the use table here, I remember at the November meeting with the planning board, I got the impression that this use table would help to make things more conforming. It would help uh, eliminate a lot of the special use permits, that it would be an improvement on, on what was allowed in the uh, over and above what was allowed in the general uh, commercial district. And I, I did a, a count and looked at, you have permitted, special, or not, not allowed, and items that went from reduced in usage, rights were taken away versus rights that were expanded upon in the traditional Main Street, there were 40 changes that t took away rights, and six were added. For the pedestrian friendly, 12 were taken away, and only seven were added. And for the neighborhood district, 31 were taken away, and 10 were added. And then there were like these little asterisks with special notes. There were nine in the traditional Main Street, only two in the pedestrian friendly and four in the, the neighborhood. So that those little special asterisks means that, oh, there's a little 
hitch. You got to look at it a little bit more closely. It may be only allowed in certain <coughs> cases. So I, I think I, I was under the impression that this would improve and, and give more options to the general commercial people and or properties. And I don't think it does. And at least at, at in my estimation of reviewing this. Um, and I think it, it's true that there's a future plan, and I see a future plan for for the roadway and having parking, and I think that would be useful, um, especially in the north end. That might be, uh, except for the snow removal, you might have to not permit the parking <laughs> during a snowstorm <coughs> in order to, to plow. But it, it has potential, and, and it, it may help um, those areas uh, with just changing the lines on the road. So that you, my, my biggest problem with getting these sidewalks on certain parts of Main Road was you eliminated any parking on Main Road. At least if there was a dirt uh, and no curb, you could just pull off and, and, and pull off the, the road. But by putting those sidewalks in and curbstone, you can't do that anymore. So you can't park. So it made it even more difficult for uh, people who have businesses on Main Road uh, to have anybody. They have to have off-street parking, and that, and especially in the North End, very north is very difficult. So I think I think there's a lot of concerns, um, and I think we just need perhaps to review this the use table a little bit more closely um, against the vision of what what we need to see in those areas and I think we need to somehow just get a consensus and and certainly address the issues that the business owners that have been here tonight have have raised thank you okay. mr. Tate um, Yes, Mr. President. Um, I would like to urge the council not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, and I want to talk about the use table in particular. First of all, the use table, this is not the comprehensive review of the Tiverton Zoning Ordinance use table, which it needs. There does need to be a real look at all of the uses across all of the zones, a modernization of the uses that you have, and a comprehensive look. This was actually a freebie, if you will. As part of the challenge grant, the contract to do the commercial zones allowed for the use of the consultants and therefore their time and the planning board time as they reviewed it to go through the commercial part of the use table to at least get a start on it and deal with some of our most egregious problems which have caused problems for a decade or more, such as the asterisk with the shopping centers. So what this allowed was a start on the use table. So I would urge you not to say we're going to throw all this out because it's not perfect. Of course it's not perfect. And one of the good examples there was this idea of the hospital and the healthcare centers. Yeah, our existing one lumps hospitals and healthcare centers. It would make sense to split them out and have medical offices separate, but there was trying to make this manageable and understandable and not too much of the changes, enough changes here without doing radical changes to the use table. The other thing is, I think when you're counting them, several of you counted, well, if we changed it, if it was permitted in the general commercial and, and now two out of the three zones we made it a special use permit and only permitted in one, saying, well, we took it away twice and gave it one. It's not that. It's two-thirds, one-third. It's taking what's allowed across of it and spread over three separate zones. So to count it in all three columns as three changes is to triple count it and not even counting the changes correctly. So I think, one, you've got to look at it, what you're looking at, that percentages of the changes, and two, don't reject the whole thing just because it's not where you'd like it to be completely. 
I would suggest if you're going to do it, if you have a specific change you want to make, make a motion, want to change this particular thing from this to this. If there's a vote, that's what we have a public hearing. As long as it's done in the course of the public hearing, it can be amended. If you want to say, okay, we think the, the likelihood of hospitals coming in is so slim, we still want to change it now, or we want to strike out the word hospital and make it just medical offices and make that permitted, make the motion, do it now, make the changes, um, and, and or make the motion to direct it so I can do it as part of a motion for you at the next meeting. Um, but don't reject the whole thing, particularly you've spent, Kate, uh, how much money on advertising and notice? Um, almost $10,000? No. Okay. What do we spend in advertising? Over $6,000 on advertising and notice. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to go through that again if you can avoid it. So let's make sure that you adopt the stuff that a majority of you are comfortable with and want to do it, do it now in this cycle as part of this hearing, even if you have to continue the hearing. Um, but be specific in the changes and keep it moving so you're not wasting that $6,000. Not to mention the money from the challenge grant, including the town's match on the challenge grant. Okay. Um, I personally think that it's a start. But I, I do think that we need to uh, continue this hearing, uh, whether it's to our meeting on the 23rd or the meeting on the 30th. That's a decision we will make. Uh, there are a lot of good things in here. Uh, but I think, in my opinion, that this whole form-based code was somehow to make it easier for businesses to do business in Tiverton. And when you look, especially on Main Road, when you look up and down Main Road, there are old gas stations, there are old all sorts of buildings that are empty right now. And whether their permitted uses are still there, I don't know. I mean, obviously that would be somebody would have to look at the building and see what they're going to put there. But I think even as a layperson, I find this very confusing in some areas because it really doesn't tell me if I'm a business person, you know, when I look at something and go, okay, it's permitted, but, or it's not permitted, or it's a special use, but you know that you can still go before the zoning or eventually maybe the council and ask for some sort of variance. So I, I, I just think that we need to understand a little more the, the, over, the total overview. I mean, all of us know that, that something has to be done regarding the zoning in this town and what areas are for commercial and what areas are for recreational and what areas are for, you know, whatever, rather, so we don't have this hodgepodge that we have now, where if you drive down Main Road, you've got everything from residential to, you know, banks to drug stores to, you know, you name it, we've got it. And so how do you put forth a vision that says, okay, this is what we envision, but you've got to look at what's already there. And rather than having to look at every single property and end up with a million special permits, you know, special use permits, I mean, I, I just want to make sure that we look at this in, in totality and try to make it as easy as possible for someone to come in and do business in town. But the same token, not take away the rights of some people who are already there. I think one of the ideas of looking at division is to go back and look at the idea that we, don't, we didn't change the general commercial district as a whole. We thought there are unique aspects to Main Road and to, to uh, Stafford and Bulger Marsh that suggest that the zoning should be more specific to what you think is, is going to be the opportunity for the future of those areas. And that is where the vision comes in. It's not to have a, one continuous commercial strip mm -hmm. and try to fill it in with whatever uses come along, but give it some direction, give it some thought as to the direction. And that was the purpose for setting up the three sub-districts within the, the general commercial. And within those, there are, yes, there are uses that are special permit. There are uses that are, that are not allowed. There are uses that are permitted as of right. With the thought that each of those areas is unique and different 
and so has that opportunity. So if somebody, if somebody comes in with a business and says, I want to build X business, well, you're not going to put it in a residential area. You may not put it in one of these sub areas, but there is a place for it. There is a place and there is a basis for putting a use in. And that was, and that was the thought that went into this, to, to provide something that, that is unique to Tiverton based on the development you've already had in place and what you want to have for the future. Okay. I just want to say that um, I, I don't want to give anybody the impression that I, I, I didn't like or didn't appreciate this document. I, I think this document is actually um, very, very good, wonderful, in fact. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a terrific planning document. It's, a, it's got a vision. It's got all of the, check all the keywords you want. Um, the only concern I have are these is the special uses, and I just, for some reason, can't get special use permits out of my teeth, and um, and and that's really, and and I've gone through the list again, and whittled it down to about seven that I think are actually really important, and um, and if we're going to go the route of continuing the public hearing, then I suppose I'll go home and draft motions for seven of these so we can talk about them, you know, with more um, depth and detail if that's the um, will of the council. But I do think this is a good document and I think all the hard work you folks put in and, and the input from the public is not um, lost. It's, it's, it's a good document. <laughs> I'm just really um, hypersensitive to special use permits. And, and again, I, I think th that's the whole issue is that when, when we look at things and know what has been businesses in town that may or may not be here anymore, and they probably all were under special permits at one time. So I think those are the types of things that we're trying to get away from to uh, have it easier to understand that if you're this type of business, I mean, right up front, you have an idea whether or not you're allowed or not. But if you go down and somebody tells you, well, according to the new code, it's not allowed, or it's a special permit, but you drive by and you see an old sign for the same type of business, you know, and you wonder, okay, what changed? You know, if you're not from town and don't, don't know the history. But again, I, I think that's why I would entertain a motion that we continue this public hearing because I, I would like the council to uh, put forth their specifics. Uh, so at least that way we can, you know, uh, address some of these and maybe expand on them, uh, you know, to maybe clarify some of the, the language. So, you know, we, we know we're not going to have a hospital, but maybe we could, we could have a medical center of some sort. Uh, so those types of things to, to clear up the language. So uh, I would entertain a motion to uh, continue this either to the meeting of the 23rd or the meeting of the 30th. Mr. President, I'll make a motion that we continue the public hearing to our June 23rd meeting in charge, um, you know, the council to come prepared to, what's that? I'd just like to make a comment that Ed will not be here for yeah, the that's, that's right. meeting. So you may not want to do And when is the next one? The 30th? 30th. I mean, I don't have to be here. No, I, I mean, I, I can call in. <laughs> it's just that the whole council would yeah. be better on the 30th. The 23rd okay. Is already okay. Well, can, can I make 30th. a suggestion that you continue the public hearing to the 30th and specify 7 p.m at town hall, um, but perhaps the council members could come with their written suggestions at the meeting on the 23rd. And if you can get the written suggestions to myself and Kate, then perhaps um, maybe we could consolidate some of that. You can still have them for the meeting on the 30th if they're not used, but we might be able to consolidate it and have a like one addendum if with I, several if, other if things. If I make a suggestion that we uh, email them to uh, the town clerk. Okay. That's and fine then that way she can uh, forward them to Kate and yourself. Okay. Is this some kind of deadline on approving this for some reason, or? No, there's not a deadline. You have to continue it to a date certain. That's fine, but this, I don't know. I, I get the impression I'm kind of getting pressured into getting this through. Only. I'm the only person who feels that way. 
Oh, it's been, it's been something that's been a long time coming. I mean, oh yeah, I mean, we've uh, needed this for a long time. Well, we need a long time, but I think but it definitely needs more work on it, and I don't think we should rush it either. And you can, you well, I can think the next step is definitely to come back with certain motions written out to continue the. I think we should again, look at suggestions editing. and not really be prepared to vote on them that night. That's that's what I'm getting at. I missed that. I'm oh, sorry. It's like I have no problem getting coming up with suggestions and probably getting um, more input from business owners that we haven't heard from tonight, and finding out what uh, we can get rid of some of the. Well, in my opinion, looking at the causes of our zoning problems, which we talked about, the non-conforming uses, and so how, how, how we can we uh, at least minimize that from continuing. That, that, that's, I see that as mostly the root cause of some of the issues we have now is all the pre-existing or non-conforming uses that we have. If we can find a way to minimize this in these new districts so it's not a problem going further, uh, I have no problem doing that. I just don't feel like if I... All right, I have the suggestion, and we also have to vote on it tonight. You know, why we have to vote on it that night? I don't think we have to vote on it tonight. Um, I'm not saying tonight, but like that that meeting or whatever. Well, it'd be I, good to I, vet I, them I, out I and talk good. about them. And all right, now we'll re all right, this looks good. Let's put it forward, and we can get get something amended. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, I, I, my own opinion is that I I don't feel as though this has been a rush process, and. Um, I have no problems voting on it. I have, you know, if I didn't, if I weren't a curmudgeon um, on these special use permits, I would be happy to vote on it tonight. Um, but um, I'm, I don't know what else to say then. I don't think this has been a rush process. I think we've been talking about this for the better part of two years. Uh, I'm actually, the process actually, is rushed. I'm, I'm saying I feel like I'm being rushed to make a decision now. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and understood. If I'm making you feel that way, I apologize. I didn't say it was you, Brett. I didn't say it was you. But uh, again, those of us who have been here a while, uh, we have heard issues regarding our zoning in our districts for as long as I've been on this council. And uh, this is a great step forward. So I, I think we, we do, do need to maybe clean it up, um, pick some wording, and, and I think we should move on it. But uh, again, I'm still uh, entertaining a motion. I'll second. Uh, oh, let me let me just change it. I'll make a motion that we continue the public hearing to the June 30th meeting, and um, ask members of the council to forward suggested edits or other pertinent comments to the town clerk ahead of the June 23rd meeting, so that they can be compiled accordingly ahead of the June 30th meeting. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, we will continue this public hearing uh, to we, June 30th. Me. Yes. When we continue the public hearing, don't we have to state that the um, venue would be back at the town hall? Yes. Well, yes. This yes. Yes. The public hearing will be held at uh, the nice town hall so at 7 p.m. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Your hard work. Great. Greatly appreciate it. Okay. Appointments and resignations. We have the resignation historic preservation advisory board, Cynthia P. Allen of 46 Peaceful Way. We have the juvenile hearing board, Cynthia R. Costa of 335 Stone Church Road. Planning Board, David Holmes, 3631 Maiden Road. Tree Commission, Rosemary Tessera, 10 Evans Avenue. Waste Water Management Commission, Peter Andramos, 1506 Mail Road. They have all submitted their resignations. Uh, I will entertain a motion that we accept, accept them with regret and ask the uh, town Clerk to send them a letter thanking them for their service. So moved. Second. I have a motion. A second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay. Unfinished business. Pauline Richard, 
Request for streetlights installed on Ladue Lane from Winterbury to Teabury. Recommendation from DPW Director and Police Chief Blakey. Continued from May 27th. Okay, we called her and told her it would be continued because we didn't have the response to the cost on the putting the light in. Okay, this continued to the 23rd or the 30th? And someone missed the balloon. Yeah, I, I, I've contacted them three times, twice by email and once um, by phone, and I just haven't got the estimate to uh, possibly put the street up like the do street you, light. Do you up. have? Do you think you'll have it by the 23rd, or would you prefer the 30th? I, I would, I'll press them. Yep. On, I'd like to have talked to her three times, and um, I expect I expect the estimate soon, and I should have it by the 23rd. I'll have something for you. Okay. Okay, um, so this will be uh, carried over to the meeting of the 23rd? Yes. Okay, financial business, town administrator, DPW director. Oh, Matt left, okay. <laughs> Steve. 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 Request budget transfer totaling 5500 from account 5540. 7611 gas oil and fuel to cover this year's fuel deliveries from account 5540 5156 leaf of 1500 and 5540 and 6-6698 six sand salt gravel and pipe for 4000 um, Mr. President this is another case of shuffling end of year funds to cover uh, expected bills or current bills uh, due to the uh, tough winter season we had uh, this year uh, we have um, gone through a lot of fuel, plowing, sanding, etc. Uh, we did have some funds left in our sick leave buyback account that we uh, hopefully will use. And we had some uh, sand and salt and gravel money left because we couldn't get salt delivery. And um, that's what we hope to transfer uh, to our gas and oil. So we'll have gas, oil, and fuel for the rest of the year. Okay. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Move that we authorize transfer of $5,500 to account number 5540-7611 to cover uh, fuel deliveries from accounts 5540-5150-1500-5540-6698-4000. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thanks, Thank Steve. You. Okay, Chief Blakey, request budget transfers total 35300 to account 1120-7980 from account 330-517 Holiday Police for 14500 account 1060-5100 Department Manager Salary Code Enforcement for 2800 and account 5130-5102 Staff Salaries, AFSCME Maintenance for 18000 and this is to cover what, Chief? The um, the fifty the fourteen thousand five hundred from the police budget out of the salary account. This was for the parking lot that was paved at the police station. Uh, the money was we initially thought through the budget committee process last year was going to be put in the paving account mm -hmm. or future needs, and that was going to be uh, to do the parking lot. Part of that money was never put there, and the parking lot was done last year. And we're just cleaning up taking care of that, the, the, the uh, delinquent bill. Okay, and the 2800 is that also for the that, parking that, uh, lot? That 2800 was from uh, uh, the administrator, uh, got those funds from the, the budgets that he uh, oversaw, oversaw. Okay. Okay, so the total cost of the, of the 35, parking lot was 35300 Yeah, was it more than 35,000? 35,300, I believe so. I, th I thought there was a portion that you had already budgeted. But this is the portion that wasn't budgeted. Right. The, 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 entire, bud the entire process was $35,000. What I sought to get from the budget committee, which was approved, was $20,000. 
Mr. Bellucci had done another portion of the uh, parking lot that he felt he had funds for, because apparently they weren't, the funds were not there. For you. Uh, again, this was both something that was, I thought, was uh, approached, uh, approved by the Budget Committee last year. And with Mr. Gonzo had oversaw this, and it was going to be, the funds were going to put, be uh, put in there for that. Okay. Yeah. Mr. President, just for clarification mm -hmm. on this, the um, agenda only listed as account number 1127980, that's actually the unfunded account. I just, we had a phone call on it, that's why I'm mm -hmm. letting you know. Um, I know. We neglected to put in the title for that account. It has no bearing on it, the account number's there. Yeah. It's been properly advertised, but I'm just, just for clarification, that account is uh, one that the treasurer has that mm -hmm. she pays out of unfunded. Yeah. Okay. And if and if I recall, uh, the twenty thousand was to do. Uh, d don't don't be specific. It was like the front. The front and, the front then, and then and then then you ended up doing the back half. Where the public had access mm -hmm. in pretty rough condition. Yeah. And when Mr. Bolucci came over, he checked the whole thing for grade for water running off his property, and we excavated the whole side. The would be the uh, east side of the building as well. And we did that two thirds of the lot. There's still one third that has to be built in the future sometime. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. I move that we authorize a transfer totaling $35,300 to account number 11207980, fiscal year 14 unbudgeted items to cover an overage for paving the police station parking lot. Do I have to list the accounts? As, as listed. As, as indicated in F2. <laughs> second. second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, sir. New business, town clerk. This is the... Um, request to approve the internal posting we've done some um, Denise and I have done some job descriptions trying to make them a little more clearer and more in depth as to what we're looking for uh, the funding has been approved uh, for the fiscal year and that is for the board of canvas clerk to on uh, handling elections okay it's been it was discussed thoroughly with the budget committee on the council at that yep. point yep. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we um, approve the internal posting of a full-time board of Canvas clerk um, as described um, in item G1. Second. We have a motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, Treasurer, internal posting request to advertise part-time accounts payable clerk with job description. That would be the same, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. um, she's asking for the internal posting or advertising should no one apply mm -hmm. from within, because right now we're just going through a shift. I have a um, person that is retiring on June 30th, the licensing clerk, so we're kind of posting and shifting positions through. We're trying to get them in line, and this one may need to go out to advertise. The funding is there as well. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve the internal posting and request for advertising of part time accounts payable clerk with job description. Second. We have motion second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Any town administrator, ratification of two year contract for part time non union municipal court clerk Eugene Gauthier. Mr. President, this position falls under my. Um, department as well. It is the um, part time 12 hours a week clerk. Last year, for some reason, he was only given, he's not, it's non union mm -hmm. part time, and he was only given a one year contract. And speaking with him, he's not much sure beyond a year or so he will be staying uh, before he completely retires. So we didn't see the need to go past two years the salary in there is only listed for the first year so that the town administrator whatever he proposes to do with some of the other contracts he'll reconsider the salary for the second year 
and the contract and the impact statement, um, which only totals $137 for the year, has been uh, made public per contract mm -hmm. as it should, uh, per charter. Yep. Okay, I will entertain a motion. I move that we ratify the two year contract for Eugene Gauthier, part time non union municipal court clerk. Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, Councilors Grillick and Pelletier, Aye. improving t trash and recycling infrastructure and performance at town parks and beaches. This is the exciting part of it. <laughs> Oh, you're going to get blinded again. <laughs> Jay, oh, we we'll all moved down one. Yeah, yeah. I think we can move a little. I don't know how to move. Almost finished. Did everybody? Actually, you can sit in Bill's seat. Yeah, I You know what? I'm going to, I'll, I'll grab Bill's seat. Yeah. Okay. Make life easier. Okay, as long as I get one back, it's fine. Does anybody need anyone need one of these down there? We have the I got it. Yeah, it's about okay. number five in the back. Yeah. Okay. I'm taking this personal. Well. Big belly. <laughs> it's not all right, so um, what um, was handed out is actually um, two additional slides that go at the end. Um, we didn't have it in time for um, the packet to be put together, but really just want to take the opportunity to address something that I, I know for many folks in town continues to be one of these things that, um, you know, as Tiverton gains visibility within the broader kind of Newport County state region, country. Um, it might seem small in the grand scheme of things, but uh, for anyone who spends any fair amount of time at one of our parks, um, recreation centers, or beaches, the problem of trash and litter um, is just becoming more and more of an issue. Um, and so Brett and I wanted to put forth some ideas uh, for how we might want to improve infrastructure here. So uh, really quick, in summary, you know, Tiverton, thanks to the efforts of a lot of folks, um, including our recycling committee and landfill committee and others, um, we've made a lot of decent progress when it comes to increasing our municipal recycling rate. Um, you know, just the last couple years in terms of tonnage here, you know, just going up from, uh, you know, 1,884 tons in 2011 to almost 2,000 tons in 2013. That's really fantastic process, uh, progress rather. However, when you visit any one of our town parks or recreations or, uh, or beach facilities, you don't really see that playing out um, and it kind of contradicts that, pro uh, that progress that we've made. Um, given the fact that I have three young kids uh, who are very active in town sports, I am at uh, our recreation facilities, many of our recreation facilities, um, at more times during the week than I can shake a stick at. And so um, I see, it, coupled with the fact that leagues such as uh, Tiverton Youth Soccer and Tiverton Little League are trying to up the ante, if you will, in putting on um, more tournaments and bringing in folks from other towns. Uh, we have a lot more volume coming through our town uh, recreation areas. We see <coughs> beaches being used more. So greater volumes of people plus the fact that everyone's trying to make a little extra money with concessions. We get a lot of waste being generated and um, we don't necessarily have what we need in place to handle that. Um, we know that uh, frequency of emptying the bins and barrels is not enough. That's been talked about. That's very much um, you know, that's not necessarily pointing the fingers at anyone, it's just a reality here. Um, we really feel that recycling best practices can be achieved with a very modest investment of materials in time. Um, and that sort of investment can pay dividends um, quite a bit um, when you talk about the image and enjoyment of our community of Tiverton. Next slide, please. 
So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes kind of explaining how these best practices can be put into fruition using one field um, in particular, um, and then we'll kind of quickly go through some of the examples. So let me kind of orient you and others to what this is. So this is the current view of town farm. So this is the boys uh, field, Sylvia field, and then the lower soccer field is off to the right of the slide. So anywhere you see a red um, circle, that's the current location of one of um, our 50 gallon barrels, right? That's used for trash and pretty much anything else. Um, the green diamonds uh, is a current location for a recycling bin. So as you see, um, they are kind of spread out all over the place, not really any too much of a rhyme or reason there. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and here is uh, Daniel's field and LaPointe field. So this is the girls softball side up on the up on the left and then the lower baseball field on the right. Again, a little bit of a hodgepodge here and there, trash barrel, recycling bin. So pra best practices here are, are pretty straightforward and, and just anecdotally, I've done a lot of work in this area at my employer as we look to turn around um, recycling. Um, practices and make our business uh, more sustainable. Um, and there's really just a couple rules of thumb that, that make it real easier for folks. And the key is to make it easy and convenient for folks to get rid of their waste in the proper way. So the first best practice is to always place a trash barrel in a recycling bin side by side. So you have a convenient choice. You're making it convenient for the consumer to make the right choice in terms of how to um, get rid of their waste. Um, you definitely want to be placing both a recycling bin and a trash barrel close to a concession area um, if, if they are present. Um, and you really want to try to reinforce as much as possible um, the, the value of disposing waste and recycling in a, in a responsible way with clear and consistent messaging. Um, and of course we want to be emptying the bins and barrels frequently to avoid you know smells and wildlife and all that sort of stuff. Um, so the short-term recommendations here is to um, leverage some of those great profit-sharing funds that appear to be sitting around collecting dust um, from the Rhode Island Resource Recovery Corporation um, that we get each year for our municipal recycling performance. Um, if my research is correct, uh, the current balance is in the neighborhood of $47,000. And so um, we want to be able to leverage those funds to invest in some new, contemporary, visually appealing trash and recycling bins instead of the hodgepodge 50-gallon barrels and just whatever we could pull together. Um, such contemporary, visually appealing um, kind of pieces of infrastructure here really go with uh, the image and the character of the town that we're trying to portray um, and could really go a long way to help people um, make the right choice here. We want to also try to reinforce it, uh, positive behavior with a, a modest investment in signage. The, the sign that's on the cover slide here is actually from our Booger Marsh uh, Rec Center, and that's a fantastic example of what could be used here. Um, and we certainly want to try to increase the frequency for emptying, especially during the busy times of year, which are the spring and the summer months, and then certainly into the fall. Again, many, many more tournaments uh, coming to the recreation centers. Obviously, much more volume hitting our beaches as well. Next slide, please. So um, when you put those best practices into play, Here's what town farm kind of looks like. So you're going to see more. Um, first of all, you're going to see a trash bin and a recycling bin paired side by side together. And you're going to see them located at um, more kind of strategic locations along the park. And this does not necessarily have to be set in stone. This is just a recommendation. But we certainly have them paired up by the concession stands, both for the baseball field um, and the soccer field. We also put a pair down by the playground there. There are picnic tables there. Lots of trash always accumulating there on the weekends. And then certainly down here on the lower left um, uh, where the walking track is. Next slide. Um, this is Daniels and LaPointe field. Again, um, improved recycling and trash bins put together, flanking the dugouts by the concession stands um, and over uh, in the playground areas as well. I'm going to move quickly through this. Uh, you're going to kind of get the idea here. So this is the 
current situation at the Boogamark Rec Center, um, only one recycling bin on that entire property, lots of trash barrels here, there. This place is a mess. Um, this is what it looks like uh, with best practices put in place. Uh, this is Southfield, so this is behind the fa fire station on East Road. Current, this is what it looks like uh, with best practices. Um, this is Fort Barton current, Fort Barton with best practices. Uh, this is Grinnell's Beach, um, lots of trash barrels, um, nothing in the way of recycling. So this is our thoughts on how to redo that. So again, pairing trash with recycling all along the beachfront at existing locations, over by the playground, and certainly by the bathrooms. This is Fogland Beach. There is nothing at Fogland Beach. Um, I, I was there on Sunday night again, picking up cardboard, picking up a couple bags of trash that I bring home with. This is out of control. Um, and I think we really need to uh, make an investment in putting some infrastructure here in order to take care of this really important resource. Um, this is just a suggestion. Um, try to equally space trash and recycling bins along uh, both sides, certainly over by the playground and uh, over um, uh, downward, kind of like the RVs go. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Brett to talk a little bit about longer term recommendations. So uh, the long term recommendations, uh, you can see some additionally uh, visually appealing. Um, these are very high tech uh, solutions to municipal and, and park waste disposal are called the big belly solar compactors. And they are, you know, fairly self-contained. They have a solar panel on top of the battery pack in it. They have smart technology that lets the DPW know when they're full. They hold about 10 times as much trash as a normal 55 gallon drum because it's got an electronic compactor inside of it, which crushes the trash. Um, they have units that compost paper. That, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a whole new uh, and exciting kind of way of, of doing um, municipal waste disposal. Um, and these are the, these are the high-tech units, and they're always paired in modules side by side, one with, with recyclables and one with, um, with trash. And they're, if, I mean, J I, Joan works in the city with me, and Bill is Frequence Boston. They just put, uh, I think, 350 downtown last year, and they did 100 more very recently, um, and they work really well. So the summary um, that, that I'll take you through is, and this is sort of to synthesize uh, Bill's technical experience and, and what I observe and what we've experienced recently. The main um, components to a strategy for both reducing um, litter and also dealing with the mechanics of it from, from DPW and from the administrator and, and whatnot is a, is a sort of three or four pronged um, approach. Bill talked about access. We have to create additional access points for people to dispose of waste and the increasing the opportunity for folks to dispose of it properly is, um, is even better. Um, because I think what we've found just from experience is it goes one way but not the other. If, if you fill a trash barrel, you don't necessarily have the option to fill the recycle with trash. That's, a, that's not what we want. But what happens is people fill the recycle bin and then the trash gets overflowed, which is also not what we want, but less harmful. Also, we need to create a system of increasing the frequency of which we dispose of and, we, and sort of creating a permanent system, a schedule that we know where all these things are. We've got a map, we understand the, the hot points and once we I think Bill and I've talked, once we get um, establish actual points, enough disposal points, we'll know how much trash and how much recyclables we're generating. And we can pl plan with a, a little bit more precision when we're going to need to do that um, and how, how frequently. Increasing awareness is really, I think, the most important thing after <coughs> we increase the access. If we, inc if we make sure people know where these are, they need to be visually appealing, they need to be brightly colored, they need to have signs. 
um, it really it, it sounds silly but it's it's it almost boils down to putting a bin in front of someone so that they can do the right thing um, and the increasing disposal options I little anecdote I walked down Riverside Drive yesterday and um, one of the doggy um, waste stations was full of trash so that's another you know sort of indicate yeah I imagine so yeah And that's, that's another sort of, you know, arrow in our quiver, as it were, is partnering with folks like you guys that, that, that have the experience in the, in the sort of understanding of these dog waste stations and... Um, hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's all of these things kind of put together in a, in a comprehensive way that we have trash, genuine trash, recyclables, anything that's recyclable, and, and things like the dog waste stations, which are convenient for folks who are, are in a more pedestrian-friendly area. And that kind of all comes together with a cooperative problem solving, which involves all the players in, in litter disposal in, in town. You can go ahead, next slide. Sir? I've only got two slides. So I put some round numbers together, some, some pretty simple figures, because I figured everybody is interested in, in doing a, a, a good deed, but there's also a cost involved with it, and everybody wants to know what that is. And so at the very basic level, those really attractive steel um, coated with thermoplastic rubber with the hoop on it that said recycle and trash that was pictured earlier in Bill's slide. Those are about a thousand dollars for the duplex, which is a considerable amount of money, but they do the job really well. And they're attractive, they're locking, they're on a, a concrete pad typically. Um, you can't mistake that they're trash barrels, but also they're visually very pleasing. And, and a, any of the heavy duty units, the, the plastic, the recycled plastic ones that were featured above it are around the same price. They're about 500 to about $600 for each barrel. Um, these aren't, you know, plastic garbage cans like you have in your house. They're meant to not be able to be removed and they take an impact and whatnot. And then we've got the cheapo um, kind of standalone units that are about $300, and that's what we kind of what we have, a recycled 55-gallon drum with a head on top that's got a plastic flap door. Um, and the pet way stations are about 250 to $400, which is about what you, it falls in line with what, the fo what you folks are doing as well. They vary the signage and the type of container and whatnot. So the smart belly units are really they're the interesting um, and the big belly units are the interesting component to the, the waste disposal and they make two they make one that's non-compacting and it still has all the smart technology um, and they make one that does compact and obviously you can see the price seventeen hundred and fifty per non-compacting unit about three thousand dollars per the compacting unit and the duplex, which they recommend one of each, one for recycling, the non-compacting for recycling, the compacting for um, trash, is, um, is 4230 for the unit. Um, that just gives us some baseline to talk about if, that's, that's all I've got, Bill. Yeah. Open, so, so. I, do have, I do have one question. Yes. Uh, with, with the numbers that you just put together, Roughly, what do you think the total project would cost eventually with all of the playground? I've got a fire with you next week. I, I, I think we could very easily put those. I, I mean, we didn't do the math. I, I'd venture, I think I counted we were adding about 25 new um, tandem stations. So even if you went with the top of the line, which are those tandem uh, side by side, 
Um, that means $25,000. Uh, and that's all at once, doing everything as one fell swoop. But certainly, um, this is the first step in looking at what, what the needs are out there. Does that sound about right, 25 for? I, I, I think that's how many. That oh, yeah, cer certainly. And I don't think we're talking about, and I don't want anybody to think that we're suggesting we outfit the town with a bunch of, of these big belly units, you know, 25 or 30 of them. They're, they're, very, they're very good for very specific purposes. Um, and, and otherwise, if it's a place you're going to dump regularly and there's going to be enough traffic where you can see, um, it's, it's, it's a very expensive trash can. Um, so if you don't need to use the of the unit, but in a place where um, maybe we, we don't get to very frequently or it's remote enough or it's just not used enough, it, it may be worthwhile. Or an area that's, I mean, fills up in a day, that's kind of a, a good option as well because it would, it would extend, the, extend the time at which, the interval in which we would be dumping. So if, if we eventually had something in a pedestrian area that needed to be dumped every couple of days, we now turn that into every week and a half or so. Okay. So it's less, you know, infrastructure costs from a manpower and a vehicle point of view. Okay. I, one more question. Yes. Do, you, do you have a timetable for this? Uh, okay. Are you looking to do it this summer? Or just spread out I, I, I would like, months. coming off of this discussion, to ask the town administrator to work with the DPW director to yeah. try to scope this out and what makes sense. I think it would be great perhaps to try to make some inroads here ahead of the fall. Try to get something at the, maybe by the beaches by the, by the mm. end of the summer and certainly for the big fall recreation season it would certainly be advantageous. Yeah, I was asking the questions only because I think we're going to have to scope it out. I was going to make a suggestion, Steve. Uh, why don't we just put this on the next agenda for the landfill committee? I think we should address it. That'll give the input from the DPW, get the input from the landfill. We know how much money we have in the accounts. Uh, and we'll know what questions to ask uh, uh, Brett and Bill after that. Can I just say yeah. one thing about the beaches? Um, we've tried to put barrels at the beaches before. And because the beaches aren't uh, populated so much at night, they turn into dump sites. Mm -hmm. We've taken the barrels off the beaches and gone to a uh, carry-in, carry-out mm -hmm. campaign. Yep. The beaches aren't perfect, but they're much more littered when we have barrels, mm -hmm. if you can believe that. Yes. I, the stuff blows I, I, all I over the place. Mm -hmm. The seagulls take it out. Mm -hmm. And people, now that we have pays you throw, are just going to pile this stuff there because it's unguarded. Yeah, Bill, if, if I can make a, the, make a suggestion. Yeah. Why don't you and Brett tell us when you would like to meet with DPW and the Landfill Committee, mm -hmm. and we can even invite the town administrator, and let's scope it out once and for all and figure out w w what the issues are. I'm, I'm totally yeah. for You know what yeah. I'm yeah. Recycling and rubbish control beyond all reason. Yeah. Yeah. It would be the greatest thing on earth that what we banged our heads about the beaches. I, I, I can tell you in Little Compton, they do not have barrels. They had them for years, the same issue. Because at night, everybody goes down. They throw their trash in those barrels. By the morning, the beach is just littered with trash. Now there are no barrels. There's still trash, but not like they used to have. And the hope, the hope, the hope is with a advanced is not the, 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 the word, but something that is a little bit more engineered than a barrel with a plastic lid on it, um, that we reduce.